Hashem Hashem Naseh V'Natzliach, Shur Torah, Bukhim Abayim. We are back here on our Wednesday night. Stump the Rabbi, where after some Divrei Torah, Be'ezrat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the Siyat Dishmaya to uh, deliver these words as uh, he wills it uh, to the best of our ability is not enough. We always need HaKadosh Baruch Hu for everything. And uh, Be'ezrat Hashem will uh, be able to do it. And then after that, you guys ask some questions. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers. Uh, tonight's uh, shiur will be for a refuah shlema for uh, Orit Bat Esther, uh, Yaakov Ben Kochava, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, uh, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Avimori David Ben Asriya, Imimorati Doris Bat Jora, uh, and also for a, the Atzlacha Rabav, Marsha Bat Julia, Aida Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sephas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, and Louis Ben Marsha. And all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahais that continue to do the will of Hashem and continue to learn with us and get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu each and every single day. Um, to uh, give you guys a little bit of a uh, brief update, uh, some things that are going on. I know that some of you are asking if I could just throw names onto the list and add more and more names. But, uh, you know, each one of the uh, uh, people that um, is on the list, typically is somebody that is uh, continuously sponsoring and helping us in many, many different ways. Uh, it's not necessarily that we're uh, chasing money, but uh, just simply if we took every single name that everybody would send to us, it would be 25 minutes just of mentioning names and no time for the shiul. Uh, so, and again, at the same token, especially you have to uh, uh, make sure that people uh, do uh, contribute in one way or another, uh, in whatever way you can, since we don't charge for anything. So uh, if anybody wants to uh, help us and uh, at the same token uh, wants to have their names uh, uh, mentioned in the shiul, you could uh, go to uh, BH Chizuk. Uh, dot org, or you can go to the Be'ezrat Hashem website and sponsor a shiul. There are three levels of sponsorship, uh, and uh, you could sponsor one of the shiuls. One is $1,500, one I think is $3,000, another one is $4,500 uh, to help us uh, you know, continue doing what we're doing. And somebody's saying, wait a minute, you're just making a shiur out of your house. You're not, uh, why would it cost uh, $4,000 to sponsor such a shiul? Because despite the fact uh, of me making the shoe out of the house, it doesn't mean that it's just me. We have uh, almost uh, over 70 people on a team uh, and a, uh, a budget of over $100,000 a month that uh, goes out to continue running the organization. Uh, whether it's for graphics, for the movie production, for uh, helping uh, people, for running the, uh, the kolels, Baruch Hashem, two kolels. Uh, one we have uh, uh, with uh, Rav Sharvit as the Rosh Kolel, one as the uh, uh, Kolel by Rav Gidon ben Moshe. So, Baruch Hashem, we have over 30 Avrechim, 31 Avrechim to be exact, uh, which Baruch Hashem are all uh, Tzadikim, Kedoshim, and we actually just got news uh, this uh, past week that uh, our own dear Rosh Kolel, Rav Sharvit, completed his uh, Dayanut, completed his Dayanut, uh, so, which is uh, obviously a huge undertaking over 20 years of uh, dedication to uh, to get to this level of Hashem, and we have uh, uh, you know the rest of the Avrachim, uh, rest of the Avrachim are all on their way to becoming Dayanim, uh, and all of them are in the already the uh, the latter part. So, Bezot Hashem will have many Dayanim coming to the world soon uh, to help Am Yisrael get closer to Hashem and uh, be Dayanim it. So, of course, to Support all of this cost a fortune, and uh, we need as much help from you guys as possible, uh, especially those of you that can contribute on a regular basis. You know, it's a, if you contribute, whether it's $100 a month or $500 a month, or simply just your ma'asel, uh, just a ma'asel that, uh, you know, you make, Hashem gives you 100% of your income, you take 10%, you dedicate it to the Torah, uh, with our organization, Baruch Hashem, you have the best of all worlds. You have Kiruv, you have helping the poor, uh, especially poor Avrechim, and uh, you also have Kolels, you have Torah itself. Uh, so uh, for anyone out there that is uh, interested, you're all uh, welcome to do it. Uh, last but not least, uh, just last night we uh, released our new newsletter. For those of you that uh, speak Hebrew, you have uh, my weekly write-up of the weekly parasha. 
but also we have the uh, new cups uh, that uh, the Skula cups, uh, which are absolutely beautiful. We got from Eretz Yisrael. Uh, anyone that wants to uh, have an addition uh, to their Shulchan Shabbat uh, yeah, certainly should uh, get one of them. But uh, also, it's just a uh, it is a Skula for anyone that knows how to do it. So you could look up the details on our website store, uh, as well as the newsletter that was released uh, last night. If you're not getting uh, our emails, uh, then uh, let us know. I mean, if you've registered for the, uh, you know, for the, the write-up that uh, we send once a week typically, and you're not getting it, uh, check your spam because many times people uh, find our, uh, uh, you know, our newsletter and on spam because Baruch Hashem, we have a uh, significant list uh, of over 500,000 people, Baruch Hashem, uh, on the list. So many times uh, the, uh, the emails will go to a st- spam folder. When you're sending a half a million emails at a time, it uh, tends to be coded that way. Uh, or it happens. But either way, uh, if you look at your spam, you'll find us there. And if not, just send us an email to let us know and we'll register you again. Uh, so, Be'ezrat Hashem, we'll now continue with the, uh, the key part of what we're here to do, which is to learn Torah, Be'ezrat Hashem. We have, here in the exile, we have Parashat Emor. Parashat Emor is full of Kedusha, full of Torah. It's a, uh, it goes from one end to the other. And of course, Besiyat Adishmaya, we would like to uh, connect the two ends. Uh, the parasha starts talking about the issues of the Kohanim, how they have restrictions of who they can be with. They're not like regular people that can simply marry a, uh, a, a kosher Jew, but rather they have to marry a specific type of Jewish woman. Uh, but aside from that, we, uh, we have uh, at the end of the parasha, the very famous story of the blasphemer. And of course, we always uh, know from Chazal that everything that is next to each other, there is a specific reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu decreed for it to be that way, because the Torah doesn't have a, uh, everything in order. You know, many times when people first start learning Torah, they uh, tend to get confused because they say, wait a minute, how can this happen if this already happened? Or how could that happen if that didn't happen? The Torah is not in order. A, uh, when you are talking about a, uh, the, the parashot itself, they're not in uh, the order of time of when certain things happen. There are certain things that uh, are written early in a Torah that actually happen later on. And vice versa, certain things that I mentioned later on in the Torah that are uh, uh, mentioned early on. Like, for example, the story of the, uh, of the blasphemer uh, is something that uh, you see in this week's parasha. But then, if you uh, fast forward and uh, you go to uh, uh, Sefer Bamidbar, uh, Sefer Bamidbar, uh, you'll actually see uh, that there is a second part of the story of another sinner. Uh, the uh, uh, the Mikoshesh Etzim, uh, the one the, the wood gatherer. This all happened uh, at the same time, uh, one after another. And, and the reason why uh, it's uh, mentioned is because there is enough kamina. There is a uh, uh, a uh, an actual reason of why this is mentioned here. Uh, and uh, there's a question in regards to uh, to what the connection is to the wood gatherer, which Bezat Hashem we may get to later on tonight. So anyway, the question is here, uh, you know, why are the Kohanim uh, obligated to marry only a, uh, you know, a specific type of person? Where you see that, uh, you know, a Jew is obviously supposed to marry another Jew. If a Jew marries a non-Jew, they lose their share of the wall to come. Uh, today I saw that there was a uh, headline of an article. I didn't waste my time to actually read the whole article, just the first uh, few uh, uh, lines. And uh, there is a... Uh, uh, um, shock and awe in the uh, conservative movement a conservative they still call themselves jewish conservative movement of rabbis within the conservative movement defying the conservative rules of what what rules i mean they still actually have rules what rules are they they're they're violating they're violating the rules by now they're allowing to uh, to marry jews with gentiles just like the reform I've been doing for many, many years since their inception, the conservative always distinguished themselves uh, from, the, uh, from the reform, even though they're both heretics, even though they both violate Shabbat, even though they both have gone down the tubes 
throughout the generations, especially in the last 50 years, where the head of the conservative movement in Yerushalayim is a hope, a openly homosexual, but they had one thing, one leg to stand on, where they said, at least, we don't marry the Jews and the Gentiles. Well, that's no more. Now they're officially marrying Jews and Gentiles, and a few, a few of the leaders within the conservative movement, one noticeably made uh, uh, from Las Vegas, uh, said, wait, if we marry Jews and Gentiles, then there's no difference between us and the Reform. There was never really a difference between you and the reform. There was never really a difference between you and an idol worshiper because you are distorting it to lie and changing it to your likings. And it's not a surprise for anyone that's looking from the right perspective. But needless to say, you, uh, you have a world where the uh, uh, Jews are marrying Gentiles without necessarily thinking twice about it. No different than what happened at the time of Germany. Anyone that has read a little bit of history about Am Yisrael, some of the books... Uh, uh, about what transpired before the Holocaust. Many people have spent time looking at what happened during the Holocaust, but there was also Am Yisrael before the Holocaust. And you see how the great sages of Am Yisrael screamed foul and tried to warn Am Yisrael of, the, uh, of, of what's going to come if they continue sinning. No different than what the prophets, Jeremiah and Yechezkel and Zechariah and the rest of the prophets did and Isaiah uh, screaming and trying to tell people to wake up and stop sinning, stop going against the Shem, stop intermarrying. In Germany, it got so ugly that Jews were not only marrying Gentiles, but they were openly uh, making it a, uh, a, a thing to do to convert to Christianity itself. Literally, the intermarriage was through the roof. The only other time where intermarriage was ever worse in history is today, the day that we're living in Hashem Ishmo. As we get closer and closer to Mashiach, we get closer and closer to the 50th gate of Tuma, as the Or Chaim HaKadosh said in Parashat Shmot. Now, the, uh, the problem with this whole intermarriage situation is that simply, when a Jew marries a Gentile, if, it, uh, if a Jewish man marries a Jewish woman, his kids are not Jewish. And uh, if a Jewish woman marries a uh, non-Jewish man, her kids are still Jewish, Allahically speaking, but of course, it's very unlikely that they're going to live Jewish life since our own, their own parent did not live a Jewish life. And many times this leads to many problems. There was a, uh, 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 lots of corruption done before the Holocaust by the Zionists, you know, that were anti-religious, anti-Torah, but when it served them right, all of a sudden they, uh, they would do things. One example that I recently read in the, uh, the book, The Transfer, that talks about some of the corruption by the Zionists before the Holocaust to steal money from Am Yisrael to uh, uh, work together with the Nazis in order to line their pockets, is simply when they had one uh, very successful businessman, Melkin, wanting to uh, join their board, they found that there was one flaw. He was a leader, he was powerful, he had all of the uh, great ideas, but there was one problem, he wasn't Jewish. He wasn't Jewish, but he was an avid Zionist. Why? Because his father, his father was Jewish, but his mom was not Jewish. So you can't have this guy join a Jewish organization if he's not Jewish. So what did they do? They converted him. Now you would think, oh, this is great. Uh, why is that a bad thing? Because it was a fake conversion. Because the guy was uh, is, is uh, documented as still a member of the church literally less than a month before they converted him. So... The reality is, is that when it comes to Judaism, there, a person has to understand is that if you want to lie, you're only lying to yourself. You're only lying to yourself. There is no lying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There is no showing up to Shemaim and say, I tried. There's no such thing. HaKadosh Baruch Hu already knows every single thing you've ever done and every single thing you've ever th- thought of and every intention you had behind it. And when a person tries to fool, fool uh, Hashem, it, they get an additional punishment for it. So now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is very specific with Am Yisrael not marrying the Gentiles. There's literally, in the last several parashot, constant mention of how we have to stay away from the Gentiles, never, uh, never marry them, never uh, behave like them. And there's a constant mention, there's a constant mention for Am Yisrael to distinguish themselves 
from the Gentiles not to wear the same clothes so much so that if a Jew marries a Gentile they lose their Olam Abba. they go to Gehenom they get they suffer tremendously in Kafakela there's all types of punishment that they get that uh, a person if they only knew if they only knew what damage they're going to get what kind of severe punishment they're going to get for even being intimate with a non-Jew one time in their life literally they would cry tears of blood but of course most people are ignorant and they run away from the truth in every chance that they get and they have a lot of so-called rabbis that support their heretical behavior as long as the check continues to clear for their donations and unfortunately this is one of the things that the prophet jeremiah cried about when all types of false prophets would try to give people the the news they wanted to hear the good news where this prophet fake prophet it ends up being uh you know says to everyone stop listening to jeremiah he's uh he's full of negativity full of warnings don't worry god talk to me and in two years nebuchadnezzar he's going down and hashem is going to rebuild the bet Migdash. Jerem- and, and he did this after publicly embarrassing Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke to Akadosh Baruch Hu, and Akadosh Baruch Hu says, I never spoke to this guy. He's a liar. Tell Am Yisrael that because of him, they're going to get an additional punishment. They're going to get an additional punishment because they believed him. And him, as a liar, he's going to die this year. Jeremiah comes back to Am Yisrael and tells him, This is exactly what happens. This is Jeremiah, I believe, chapter 28. Just learned it today with Rabbi Ephraim. Went through some of the details. And this prophet is told in front of everyone, because you are a liar, you're going to die this year. And if you look at the dates of when everything happened, literally within two months, this guy died. This guy died, and of course, his prophecy of, uh, 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 of good news never transpired. Now, one would ask, why? Why is it such a bad thing? Even if you're lying, like, uh, like uh, Friedman, uh, Manus Friedman's son told me, so what if he's lying a little bit? what do you care look at the results so why would giving people false hope be such a bad thing because giving people false hope is changing the torah giving people false hope is against the kadosh baruch Hu because the kadosh baruch Hu's signature is emet now when a kadosh baruch Hu gives us bad news he's telling us if we do bad things bad things would happen it's not because he is uh, wants us to be scared because there's some type of good coming out of uh, you know his personal joy of us being scared it's when the prophets that he sends uh, to tell people the truth are, are are out there and they're warning people of all types of damage that will happen to them if they continue with the bad behavior going against the torah it's not because akadosh Bahu is happy that uh, these prophets are scaring people rather he's happy because they're warning them because now that certain people are warned they now are going to have a legitimate chance to make an educated ca- uh, uh, decision to change their ways it's not a scare tactic tactic but rather a warning And a warning is something that all of us need, all of us depend on. You have warnings in traffic, you have warnings on medicine bottles, you have warnings on food. All of us require warnings. But unfortunately today, the warnings have turned into scare tactics and people run away from them, especially when they have fakers telling them to run away from fear of Hashem. Now, of course, we have a Kadosh Baruch Hu that tells us it's it's extremely important for a Jew to marry a non-Jew and also to separate themselves from the non-Jews separate themselves as much as possible surely you can do business with them surely you can uh you know be uh, cordial and friendly but when it comes to uh befriending them to to such a close point where your kids and their kids are playing together on a regular basis they're invited to your house on a regular basis to uh, to eat dinner and so on there lies the problem why because if you make it normal for your kids to see non-jews in your house that uh, they could be you know hang out at all times and this non-jew is not intending on converting this is simply a non-jew that believes in uh, uh, yeshu imachimo lives in muhammad or even if he believes in god simply he's uh you know he's he's just a, a decent person and you want to be a friend with him and you want his kids to play with your kids because you think it's a good idea the gemara in masechet avodah zara says such a thing is forbidden why because even though you can decipher the difference between you and him you can decipher the difference between you and her your kids are not going to be able to do it 
and therefore they're going to see if they're able to grow up together then what's the difference between them and a jew and end up marrying each other and unfortunately this is what happened throughout our history anytime we broke the barrier between the jews and the gentiles little by little intermarriage increased and this is why i told one of my dear students who was a very very dear person a very precious person they asked me do you know of any synagogue that will accept righteous noahides to attend and i told them if it's a legitimate synagogue that has fear of the almighty they will never accept the righteous noahides to attend on a regular basis uh, and and quite frankly even once in a while is 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 probably unlikely why because there has to be a separation where even if you are a righteous noahide we have to make sure that am israel does not think that they're allowed to marry you because you're a righteous noahide and you know a lot of torah even more than the people in the community still we're not allowed to marry you now needless to say this is not a uh, 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 a prejudice against non-jews there's also limitations within the jewish community itself where certain people are not allowed to marry certain people one of the prime examples that a lot of people have a tough time with until they learn the details of what Yirat Shamayim is what fear of the Almighty is who's really running the world is the details of the Kohen the Kohen is not allowed to marry certain people not allowed to marry certain people now of course if it's the Kohen Gadol he even has more limitations than that even more limitations than that but a regular Kohen is not allowed to marry a uh, uh just anybody he has to be very very specific he's not allowed to marry a woman that has been divorced uh he's not allowed to marry a woman that is a harlot now the question is a uh, how many people out there are harlots now if you uh you know, that are looking for a shiduch to go marry a kohen that's because the definition that people think of when they think of a harlot they think of a prostitute they think of just some woman is in the streets some escort some woman that's full of full filth full of garbage that uh, even at the time of the Bet HaMikdash there's a mitzvah that forbids us from accepting the uh the sacrifice from this uh, harlot why because if the Allah says uh, Rambam explains it also that if you allow this harlot to uh take money out of her income that she makes from her promiscuity and her filth you allow her to donate that money to the Bet Mikdash, you're enabling her to continue her crime. Why? Because she has, she has a uh, uh, you know a uh, our conscience is telling her, listen, you can't be a harlot and go to heaven. You're a bad person. You're doing bad things. But then the the, the Yetzirah says, "Eh, hey, what bad things? What are you talking about? They ended up building a whole yeshiva because of the tzedakah that she's giving. So therefore, Hakadosh Baruch Hu says, not allowed to take her money." let her live with that bad conscience let her live with the fact that she is a sinner and not think for a moment that she's allowed to sin because she's using the money for good no such thing the same applies for all other unethical businesses whether it's the cash advance business or you're stealing money from selling cars or you're stealing money from selling computers or you're stealing money from selling stocks whatever it is if you're an unethical person you're taking advantage of people Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want your tzedakah you're a mechalel shabbat you're going against the torah and you think you're going to save yourself by donating a lot of money while continuing to sin you have to understand that Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to throw that money in your face. He has no interest whatsoever in people thinking even for a moment that they can continue sinning and just resolve everything by giving some staka. That's only you'll, something you'll find in Christianity and Catholicism. You're not going to find that in Judaism. Unfortunately, you will find Jews that call themselves rabbis that will actually enable people to continue sinning so long as they give staka. When the guy comes to them in a car on Shabbat, and uh they don't say a single thing why because they know that his check always clears and it's usually four digits or more so this is literally spiritual murder this is spiritual murder of the nation because our Torah clearly tells us that we have to rebuke our people we have to we have to help them we have to love them and how can you love somebody by taking his money without helping him actually go to heaven by telling him to keep shabbat and the rest of the mitzvot so now we have a situation here where the the uh the uh, language barrier be, you know, as far as the difference between hebrew and english is really the reason why people don't truly understand the meaning of this verse where it says that the kohen shall not marry a woman who is a harlot or has been desecrated 
uh, or a woman that's been divorced so most people think okay divorce we can understand uh de- desecrated we can understand well, harlot i mean were well, there are that many harlots i mean one of the reasons why kadosh bahu took us out of egypt is because the women were so modest and because the women did not uh fornicate with the uh, with the gentiles with the exception of one case that's mentioned in this week's parasha shlomit that was raped by the egyptian there was no such relation between the jews and the gentiles and hashem specifically coordinated it in such a fashion that the, the gentiles the the egyptians literally were disgusted by the jews they were disgusted by us and specifically it's mentioned at the time of yosef Tzadik. so this helped us stay away from them but unfortunately that didn't uh, that uh, beautiful blessing did not last because throughout all of the generations since the time we left Egypt the uh, the Gentiles were constantly looking to marry the Jews and unfortunately the Jews constantly had a Yetzirah to marry the Gentiles against the Torah in both cases both for the Gentiles and for the Jews and if they stay that way they both lose their eternity the Gentile loses his eternity and or her eternity and a, and, a, and the jew loses their eternity they it's it's a, it's a horrific horrific punishment you get for such relations now you have a situation here where torah says that the kohen wants to marry a jew not a gentile has nothing to do with a gentile wants to marry a jew but she's a harlot why what's the problem she uh no no this is not talking about some prostitute or some escort this is talking about a woman that was with anybody else that was forbidden to her she's considered a harlot meaning if this woman she's a righteous woman today she did tshuva she has kisurosh even without being married the dress reaches her ankles she covers everything tzadika she reads tehilim every day finishes the whole book every day she's a tzadika kdosha but one time one time she was intimate with a non-jew she was intimate with mustafa she was intimate with chris one time the coin is not allowed to marry her the coin is not allowed to marry her rashi says that a woman that's a harlot according to our torah what's a harlot it's a woman that has lived with any man who is not permitted to her because of a negative commandment and this includes not only relationship uh, uh, relationships punishable by death or karet also living with a mamzer or a non-jew meaning that even if she had a boyfriend you have a very serious problem very serious problem why because if your shiduch is a kohen you're not allowed to marry him i had a case like this one time a wonderful woman that she uh was looking to get married she found mr perfect but mr perfect was the most imperfect why he was a kohen and since she was a bala tshuva i told her you're not allowed to marry him of course there was a lot of tears and but the truth is the truth now many times people think that they can you know just do this and do that and uh, try to uh uh beat the system in some way or another all they're doing is that they're beating themselves because a kadosh then has to take care of it and typically the damage is much more severe than just a few words that cause you to cry so now the uh the the important thing is that we this is mentioned multiple times in the torah that the kohanim cannot just marry anybody they have to marry specific types of people they're also not allowed to marry converts many new converts get offended by this but it's important for you to know that for the same reason why you converted is the same reason of why a kadosh Baruch Hu says to the kohen that he's not allowed to marry you if you're a convert what's the reason the reason is that it says in chapter 21 verse uh verse uh seven uh for each one is holy to his god you shall sanctify him for he offers the 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 food of your of your god he shall remain holy to you for holy am i hashem who sanctifies you in so many words and again he says it again in in uh, verse 15 for i am hashem who sanctifies you in so many words what logic does it have to not allow the kohen to marry a woman that he thinks he loves the logic is i am hashem that's the logic i said so that's why that's why hashem doesn't have anything against the the woman per se she's a bala tshuva she's a tzadika but she's still forbidden to that kohen she's a convert righteous convert a kadosh Bahu is her father and her mother he loves her dearly 
And we are obligated to love her more than we love natural born Jews. Yet, she's forbidding to marry a Kohen. Why? I am Hashem. That's the reason. I am Hashem. That's what Hashem says. I am Hashem. That's the reason. Now you can say, yeah, but it's because of this, because of that. Bottom line is, Akadosh Baruch says, I am Hashem. That's it. That's the reason. I decide, Kohen is not allowed to marry any of these people. But they are allowed to marry others. Why? Because there is an order. An order in his system that is beyond our comprehension. There are certain souls that are designated for certain souls. If they match, they can bring an extraordinary amount of holiness to the world. If they match with the wrong soul, they can bring an extraordinary amount of impurity to the world. An extraordinary amount of pain to the world. So Akadosh Baruch Hu has a much better system than we imagine. And he knows what's best much more than what we do. Now, of course, some people don't necessarily like the system. So they say, yeah, but maybe that's relevant to the past. It's not necessarily relevant to today. And that's why you have the conservative, the reform, and unfortunately others that uh, you know, are uh, even uh, promoting uh, intermarriage. Promoting intermarriage, uh, uh, you know, t- promoting the uh, Judeo-Christian relations to be stronger and all types of other things like this, even though Torah forbids such things, forbids it. Now, of course, a person needs to know that a Kadosh Baruch Hu at the end of the parasha tells us a story of what happened. It happened that there was a woman that also wanted to beat the system in a little bit. Wanted to beat the system. What's the system? She wanted to be friendly, even though she's a slave in Egypt. It's horrible. They're killing babies. They're killing adults. There's an extraordinary amount of death everywhere, damage everywhere. People are missing limbs. People are missing eyes. People are, are, are suffering. And we are also not the only slaves. There are other nations there that are slaves too. And so there's an enormous amount of uh, uh, disaster. It's literally... A, a much much bigger holocaust than the one that we have in our history books that happened 70 years ago approximately that murdered six million jews and millions of other non-jews what happened in egypt was much much worse to be happy was literally impossible but this young woman named shlomit she wants to be happy how does she express her happiness Hello, 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 hi, hi, shalom, shlomit, because she wants to say shalom to everybody, not just to her husband, not just to our kids. She wants to say hello to the neighbor, she wants to say hello to the other neighbor, she wants to say hello to the, uh, the Egyptian that beat her and her husband. She wants to say hello to the Egyptian that may end up beating them later on. She wants to say hello to the Egyptian that just killed a few kids. She wants to say hello to everybody. Maybe because if I'm nice to them, maybe the things will change. Who said that you're allowed to do such a thing? Who said that you're supposed to have platonic relationships with some guy? Who said that you're allowed to have a, uh, a guy friend? Who said that you're allowed to do such things? What? I'm just, we're not, we're not. I know him. He's like my brother. Well, according to the Torah, he's actually forbidden to you just like your brother because you're not married. So in regards to that, yeah, he is like your brother. Your brother is forbidden to you and this guy is forbidden to you. At least with your brother, you're allowed to talk to, but this guy you're not allowed to talk to. So he's actually even worse than your brother. But unfortunately, people want to change the Torah. They want to custom make it. And Shlomit was one of those women. And what ended up happening is that one of those hellos landed on an Egyptian. The Egyptian said, oh, hello. You know what? Hello back. And he ends up raping her. And out of that rape comes this blasphemer. This blasphemer that the Chachamim, the Mekubalim, Arizal, say this blasphemer is actually the uh, Gilgul of Cain. The Gilgul of Cain, the reincarnation of Cain, was split into multiple places one was the egyptian one was korach one was this blasphemer this would have to be another reincarnation as i've mentioned in uh, my uh, shiur about kabbalah and the uh, uh, discussing uh, 
Christianity or Yeshu Imachimo, this blasphemer gets reincarnated again into Yeshua Nutsri, into Yeshua Nutsri, Machimo Vezicho, the, uh, that, uh, the, the Jew that ended up bringing more death to Jewish people in the last 2,000 years than anyone else in history, and literally being the source of all Tuma. Anyone that reads a little bit about some of the things that happened in the other side, uh, you know, the, the things with, regarding to uh, Dibukim and so on, many times you see that the, uh, the, the place of Tum'ah are constantly enticed or energized by Christianity, by the idolatry from Christianity. Literally, the Mikubalim say that the source, the, the leader of, uh, uh, um, or, or, or general, I would even say, uh, in the uh, uh, place of Tum'ah in the world, is, uh, is, is Yoshke, is the Tum'ah that he created into the world. So this already started from the creation of the world. One part of the story is this blasphemer. But the blasphemer wasn't just given as a son to anybody. You're not going to see this blasphemer, you know, be a son to, uh, to any of the tzadikim. You see uh, this one? going for a woman that broke the fence she didn't go and look for a uh a, a egyptian to marry she simply wanted to say hello she broke the fence showed on that there's a measure for measure you broke the fence what you're going to bring to the world is someone else that breaks the fence someone else that broke the fence and what ends up happening is that since this child came out of uh, out of a gentile father that meant that he had no tribe. He had no tribe. He wanted to go join the tribe of Dan because that's where his mother was from. But the tribe of Dan says, I'm sorry, you can't, uh, you can't join us because the tribe is decided based on the father. And your father is an uh, Egyptian. So you have no tribe. He said, no, we have to go to Bet Din. Let's go to Moshe Rabbeinu. They brought the case to the Bet Din of Moshe Rabbeinu. It doesn't get better than that. A, per, a person that speaks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu like one friend speaks to another. Meaning there is no wrong answer here. There is no, oh, maybe he made a mistake. Maybe he doesn't understand my case. Maybe I didn't this. Maybe I didn't that. You're going to Moshe Rabbeinu simply. It's, it's, it's literally speaking face to face with HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Chavuta. So the Bet Din of Moshe Rabbeinu looks at the case of this blasphemer and the tribe of Dan, the leaders of the tribe of Dan, and Paskins that the tribe of Dan are correct. This young boy does not have any permission whatsoever to think that he's part of the tribe of Dan. Why? His father's not Jewish. After this boy hears what happened, he gets angry and he curses Akadosh Baruch Hu's name. He actually mentions the name of Akadosh Baruch Hu and he curses it. After that, he gets arrested. And Moshe Rabbeinu asks HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what do we do with him? Now, of course, Moshe Rabbeinu knows that anyone that's a blasphemer, that curses the name of Hashem, it's a death penalty. So what's the question? Why? Why, why does Moshe Rabbeinu ask what to do with him? Simple. We have another guy named Slovchad that was a, uh, a gathering wood on Shabbat that also has to get the death penalty for violating Shabbat. So the question is, not if we're going to kill this blasphemer or not. question is, are we going to put both of them in the same cell or in two different cells? Because if they're in the same cell, then surely this blasphemer is going to think he's going to get the same exact death penalty as the Mechalel Shabbat, which is the worst type. But, if his, but since his, his penalty is less, Technically, he should be in a different cell, so he doesn't suffer extra, meaning even he's going to die anyway, but at least he'll know that his death penalty is not going to be as bad as the Mechalat Shabbat, as the one that desecrated Shabbat. That's, in essence, the question that Moshe Rabbeinu asked the Kadosh Baruch Hu. So here we see, Rabotai, that we have on one end of the parasha, we're talking about the holiness of the Kohanim and how they have to be very specific about who they pick to marry, they can't just marry any righteous girl. They have to know, understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that runs the world. He has a system. We have to follow along. And the better we follow along, the better we can produce good in the world. But when a person steers away and starts 
interpreting things on their own as soon as Akadosh Baruch Hu sends them a rebuke by telling them that the deen is not for you the deen is against you their ego could easily get in the way and they could end up cursing God they could end up violating Shabbat they could end up going against the Kadosh Baruch Hu in so many different ways and end up losing their Olam Abba. instead of losing a small battle and winning the war they end up losing everything why because they tried to break the fence they tried to recreate Judaism there's another example of this in the Gemara the Gemara in uh, Masechet Yevamot the Mishnah there page 61a the Mishnah there says that if a Kohen performed the Irusin with a widow and was then appointed to be a Kohen Gadol before consummating the marriage he may marry her here we see that there is a exception to the rule exception to the rule where if if he uh th- this Kohen was uh, uh performed the ego scene with a widow before he became Kohen Gadol he didn't know he's going to become Kohen Gadol and they already performed the ego scene this is like the uh engagement not to really be compared to today's engagement but he's a regular Kohen and a regular Kohen is allowed to marry a widow but now a Kohen Gadol is not allowed to marry a widow not allowed to marry a widow so he as a regular Kohen he got engaged to a widow but after they got engaged which in today's world it's in essence the same thing as the actual marriage itself if you compare the two it's not like the engagement of today which is a complete waste of time and money so here now he get engaged the only thing they haven't done is the actual act itself to to finalize everything and he finds out they announce hello we have good news you are officially the Kohen Gadol now we have a problem what's the problem Kohen Gadol is not allowed to marry the girl that I uh, I have a Kiddushin with what do I do Mishnah says no no he's allowed to marry her it's allowed to marry her he can stay he can stay because they already started beforehand he's allowed to continue with it and then the Mishnah continues and tells a story happened with Yeshua ben Gamla that he uh, married Martha the, to- the daughter of Baitus and she, when she was a widow and afterwards the king appointed him to be Kohen Gadol and he married her all the same meaning this story happened this type of thing happened this is not a theoretical thing that this Kohen named Yeshua ben Gamla married a uh, a widow and later her father which was the uh, king made him into a uh the, the king made him into a uh uh not a father the king made him into a um into Kohen Gadol now who is this who is this uh Yeshua ben Gamla Yeshua ben Gamla and the Gemara Masechet Baba Batra page 21a says in the name of Rav Yehuda in the name of Rav says that man Yeshua ben Gamla is to be remembered in a favorable way for were it not for him the Torah would have been forgotten by Am Yisrael here you have an extraordinary description of Yeshua ben Gamla that if it was not for him that the Torah would have been forgotten how could it be says because originally the system was that if a child had a father the father would teach this child the Torah and one that didn't have a father would not learn Torah but then the sages enacted that the teachers of children should be installed in Yerushalayim so that any youth would go there and be learned and be taught Torah and despite this if a child had a father the father would take him to Yerushalayim and he would learn Torah but it didn't solve the problem because whoever didn't have a father 
he would there would be nobody to take him to Yerushalayim to study Torah so then the sages fixed it again and said okay local authorities should be installed and they should open yeshivot in every place and they should bring the kids 16 years 17 years who lacked the education to these yeshivot to be taught by the teachers but there was still one problem left what was the problem any student that became upset with his teacher because his teacher got angry with him the student will rebel against the teacher and end up leaving why because he's 16 17 years old he already lived a life he thinks he knows everything you're installing him into some yeshiva the rabbi tells him to be quiet until he finishes what the uh chidush is this kid doesn't want to hear it the rabbi rebukes him he says what talk to me that way i'm leaving so now even though you solve the problem of bringing the yeshiva to every town even if somebody doesn't have a father he still has a way to learn Torah you still have a problem the problem is that all the guys that are coming into the yeshiva they're you know teenagers and they end up leaving because they don't want anyone to tell them what to do and this matter was not resolved until Yeshua ben Gamla came and enacted that the local authorities meaning the, the the rabbis the sages should install teachers of children in every district in town and they should bring the children starting at the age of six and seven years old to be taught by these teachers and with this new ordinance Yeshua ben Gamla ensured that the Torah would not be forgotten by Israel why because if you bring a six-year-old to the yeshiva that six-year-old even though he's a little troublemaker wants to climb the walls wants to play wants to this if you speak to him a certain way you rebuke him a certain way you do this you do this eventually you get this kid to start learning and you have this kid by the time he is 15 16 years old he's already a ben Torah. why because he hasn't been damaged for 15 years he's still relatively new new in the box and who is this thanks to thanks to yeshua ben Kamla, gamla so you would think the Yeshua ben Gamla is the greatest according to this but if we go back to our Mishnah in Masechet Yevamot we have a little bit of a problem why because Yeshua ben Gamla who married this girl this Malta but uh, Baitus is not spoken about in a favorable way why the Gemara says that the king appointed Yeshua ben Gamla to be Kohen but Sanhedrin did not Rav Yosef says Ketir kahazina acha I see here there's a conspiracy there is a connection to wicked people in his whole election of becoming a Kohen Gadol meaning that although Yeshua ben Gamla did some good things his position of being Kohen Gadol it's only because of a conspiracy connection to wicked people how could you say such a thing because he married he married this girl he married this widow this Martha but Baitus and who's this Martha but Baitus the Gemara in Masechet Baba Batra page 21a says that this Martha but, but, but Baitus I'm sorry uh, Gemara Masechet Gitin Gitin page 56a says this Martha but Baitus was the daughter of the was a daughter of a wealth, wealthy man and uh, she ended up being the wealthiest woman in Yerushalayim 
and therefore she wanted to make her new husband happy Yeshua ben uh, ben ben gamla so what she do she paid off to buy the keuna now if he's so righteous what's the problem the gemara asks this he did great things he made sure that amisla does not forget torah he made sure that there's little yeshivot in every town the kids learn torah yes as righteous as he was we have a system and the system is somebody else was supposed to be the queen gadol somebody that was greater than him and there was somebody greater than him uh, but that could not happen why because despite his righteousness there was a mistake made where they wanted to beat the system and beating the system put a stain on his spiritual portfolio that forevermore we read this Gemara, it talks about that the only reason he became a Kohen Gadol was because of a conspiracy and a connection to wicked people referring to his wife and all of the other co-conspirators that love money so here we see that someone that starts off with naive intentions like Shlomit ends up bringing terrible things to themselves and also to their kids the kid follows the same line of thinking of thinking that okay but it's not my fault that my mom got raped I still want to join the tribe yes we understand you want it but that's just not the way it works there are rules and the rules are you can't be part of the name of uh, of uh, the tribe of Dan he gets angry because they won't allow him to change the rules they won't allow him to change the Torah he curses God and loses everything but we also see someone that was considered righteous also have a stain on his uh, on his name a Kohen Gadol that was really not supposed to be a Kohen Gadol he only became it because you changed the system so now Rabotai we have these types of things happening every single day in society where people want to change what has been the norm whether it's the fashion of today Shemishmo that is literally the, the the one of the worst tragedies that ever happened to mankind or it's the education they give children today there are endless ways that you endless things you can uh, you can cry about but we've already cried about those there is one thing that we learned with Rabbi Ephraim Baruch Hashem that we're gonna cry a little more about and the reason why is because we believe that this poses a great danger to Am Yisrael that is unlike the other dangers is simply not being addressed meaning that if you're talking about the danger of immodesty surely there are rabbis and communities that are fighting the Yetzirah of immodesty if you talk about the issues of immorality pornography non-kosher food corruption within certain businesses surely there are some people out there that are fighting it sometimes it's us sometimes it's others sometimes others but when it comes to the Chabad Mashiach Now movement, rarely do you see anyone speaking against it. And if they do, typically it's on the low. It's not going to be a public statement because nobody wants a war, either because of the good that Chabad has done or does, or both, or simply because they're a conglomerate that no one wants to mess with because the second you mention their name they torture your life as much as they could possibly can whether it's simply annoying you 24 hours a day with messages threats curses all types of other wonderful things but since we work for Akadosh Baruch Hu, we have to remind ourselves at all times that if there is something that needs to be taught we are the first to do it Baruch Hashem, we've already discussed this issue multiple times, but since then, a new chidush has come up. Many of the Chabadniks that have sent me messages, 
different shluchim that are all over the place that have heard the shiur, that have heard the video where I say that this whole concept of Mashiach now is not something that the sages taught. It's not something that agrees with our Masoret. It's not something that even agrees with logic with anyone that knows Torah. But unfortunately, one after another disagrees with it for different reasons. Now we have a chidush that actually shows that there's not only the sages did not teach it but rather the torah is against mashiach now in fact mashiach now is against the torah now to believe that mashiach is going to come and can come on any given day is an obligation every jew has a jew that does not believe that the mashiach can come on any given day is going against the torah and is considered a heretic so here we're not saying not to believe that Mashiach can come, but rather to make the primary focus of your Judaism, the primary focus of your life, to constantly put flags and stickers everywhere and tell everybody Mashiach now, while the vast majority of people don't even understand what Alachot Shabbat are, don't even understand what will happen to them if Mashiach actually did come tomorrow, as they would be the first to be destroyed. As the Prophet says, that it just with his lips he will destroy all of the wicked. A wicked person is not necessarily just a murderer. A wicked person is a Mechalel Shabbat. A wicked person is someone that's married to a Gentile. A wicked person is someone that weighs seed and acts immorally. In so many words, a wicked person is the vast majority of the world. This is the reason why we have in our Torah that the Mashiach is going to come, the Goel is going to come to save all of those people that used to be Pushim, that used to be wicked, used to be criminals. Meaning, he's coming to save all of the people that have done Tshuva. But if a person has not done Tshuva by the time Mashiach comes, he's done. He is going to pay a very heavy fine, to say the least. A fine that will cost them everything. If he is not keeping Shabbat by the time Mashiach comes, he's gone forever. He's destroyed forever. You have to go in a Gainom. If he is still married to a non Jew when Mashiach comes, he lost his share of the world to come. He's not going to enjoy Mashiach now. And this is actually something that the sages discuss. Where? The Gemara in Masechet Yevamut, page 62a. This section of the Gemara talks about the mitzvah of Purbu, the mitzvah of procreation, bringing children to the world. And there's a machloket between two of the sages, Rabbi Yochanan Ravuna. And it starts off saying that Ravuna says that if a man had children, but they died in his lifetime. Ravuna says that despite that, if he had children, even if they died, nevertheless, he has fulfilled the mitzvah of pu'ubu, of procreation, and he's not obligated to have additional children. There's one of the mitzvot in the Torah, and we get in the book of, uh, uh, in Genesis, that a Jew has to bring children to the world, specifically one boy, one girl, or more. Now, what if somebody brings those kids and Hashem Ishmo during his lifetime, those kids die? Abuna says it's not his fault. He still fulfilled the mitzvah. Fulfilled the mitzvah. Rav Yochanan says, no, no, he didn't. He did not fulfill the mitzvah. He is required. To have more children to replace the ones that died. And there starts the machloket. Ravuna says, he fulfilled the mitzvah. It's not his fault the two kids died. Rav Yochanan says, no. If they died, he has to go and have more kids. So then the, the Ravuna says, I, what's the source that, uh, what's his argument? He says he fulfilled the mitzvah of procreation of Pu'ubu based on the fact that Rav Asi says that 
the son of David, meaning the Mashiach, will not arrive until all of the souls are vacated from goof. As we learn from the, uh, uh, the, the Pasuk in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 16, that says, For a spirit of redemption from before me shall be late born, and the souls I have made. So here, Rav Asi is saying that there's a place called Goof that is a chamber in heaven that separates the Shekhinah and the uh, angels. And this specific place called Goof is, uh, contains all of the souls that were created during the first six days of creation. And in order for the Mashiach to come, all of those souls have to come out of this place. And therefore, the argument that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, what the teachings of Rav Asi is, that once all of those neshamot, once all of those souls are out of this place, goof, Mashiach eventually is going to come. Now, it may happen much later after all of the souls are already out for a while. It may happen right after they're done. He's not specifying a specific time, but he's saying that in order for the Mashiach to come, there is a requirement that that place, Goof, has to be empty. No more souls. Ravuna, on the other hand, is using this specific source from Rav Asi and saying that, look, we have here a teachings that in order for the Mashiach to come, this place has to be empty. This place that has all the souls has to be empty. So that means that if this guy is a uh, had kids, he is. What does he do? What's the whole the whole uh, 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 purpose that Hashem brought procreation to the world is to bring the Mashiach. He brought procreation to the world so we can bring the Mashiach. So if I brought another couple of souls to the world that means that i've emptied out another couple of souls from this place so i serve my purpose i fulfilled the mitzvah that's the uh, argument of rav huna and he's using the source of rav asi comes rav yochanan and says no he has not fulfilled the mitzvah of procreation why because we have a pasuk we have a teachings leshevet that the, uh, we're required that through this procreation, there will be a fulfillment of God's plan, where He is the one that formed the world in order to be inhabited. And since these children have died, there is no, co- no habitation of the world through them. So here, Rav Yochanan is not disagreeing with what Rav Asi said, which is that the Mashiach is not going to come until this place, Goof, is empty. He's not disagreeing with that. He's disagreeing with what Rav Huna is saying, which is that so long as I help empty out this place and I bring a couple of souls to the the world, then I'm uh, fulfilling my obligation in the world to bring Mashiach and therefore I'm, I'm doing good. Rav Yochanan says, no, 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 you're not getting the point. Although what Rav Asi said is true and it's right and it's necessary, that's not the purpose of this world. The purpose of this world is to take those neshamot and have them fulfill the plan of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is to live a life of Torah and mitzvot, to live a life in this world, to habitate this place. Not just to come and die as a, as a, uh, uh, um, uh, just somebody that uh, died as a still life baby, Hashem Yishmo, or some type of abortion. No, you have to obviously come to the world and fulfill the will of Hashem. Now, what if somebody had a couple of kids and he's already older, he can't have any more kids? The Gemara says, don't worry, if those, the minute those kids have grandkids, they have kids, meaning you become a grandfather, 
even if his kids end up dying before him he still fulfilled the mitzvah because there's still those souls are habitating the world meaning that there's still more torah in the world there's more people to fulfill the will of hashem and therefore the chachamim say that the grandchildren are reckoned as children and if one's children die or if the the son is discovered to be a saris or the daughter's a saris meaning that he has a son that is a uh, um, uh, not able to have kids or a daughter is not able to have kids then the father has not fulfilled the uh, the mitzvah of procreation but if the uh, the the son has produced uh, uh, grandkids then he's fulfilled the mitzvah then there is more people that are following the will of Hashem so in essence the ultimate difference between the two is that although they're both using the same exact source same exact fact that this place goof has to be emptied out before Mashiach comes but there's no guarantee that the second that the last neshama comes to the world Mashiach is gonna come or it's gonna come it's gonna happen a hundred years after it's empty because that place goof is not the ultimate purpose of the world that's just simply a condition a condition that needs to be met before Mashiach comes the purpose of the world though is for all of those neshamot that are coming to fulfill the will of Hashem to habitate the world to be able to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to learn Torah to do mitzvot and so on and in so many words this is the mistake that Chabad is making where they're in essence are taking the entire Torah the entire mitzvot everything that is dear to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, all of the commandments all of the obligations all of the reward all of the punishment and simply minimizing it into a simple condition that Mashiach now instead of publicizing to Am Yisrael to keep Shabbat to keep Tarat Mishpacha to 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 have Yirat Shamaim, to fulfill the, the will of Hashem as he said it not as you see it they have turned everything into Mashiach now meaning that we have a, 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 a motto Mashiach comes and now all the problems will be solved and what are they saying this is saying that, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe said this now because he was a tzaddik and we surely have to give him the benefit of the doubt we surely know and anyone that has heard any of his speeches and even if we heard him say Mashiach now you know based on what he wrote in his books based on what he learned from the Tanya based on what you can learn from his books or the Tanya his message and their message are not the same they're both saying Mashiach now but just like the machloka between Rav Huna and Rav Yochanan it's not the same message why the Bala Tanya which is the foundation of Chabad was something that came after the Baal Shem Tov, the foundation of Hasidut, which came as something that is an extraordinary part of Judaism, but surely is based on the same foundation as the rest of Am Yisrael, which is we have the Torah, the written Torah, the oral Torah, the foundational stone of the entire Torah is the Gemara. That's our oral Torah. We have, of course, we have our written Torah, the five books of Moses. There is no difference as far as the foundation for any part of Am Yisrael. All of us use the same exact foundation. Now, if you look at the teachings of the leaders of Hasidut, they all talked about reward and punishment. They all talked about the obligation to learn the Gemara, the Shuchan Aruch, to, 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 to fulfill the Alachot, to learn Musar, to improve yourself, to constantly fear punishment for not fulfilling the will of Hashem and going against them we have a book a kuntres that Rabbi Fine put together about a genome teachings based on the leaders of Hasidut whether it be the Baal Shem Tov Magid Mimezrich uh the uh Rabbi Elimelech Milizhinsk the the Baal Atanya uh, uh Rabbi Nachman Breslev and so on and so forth meaning that they're not different in any way shape or form from the rest of Judaism they had different teachings that were like seasonings on top of the same foundation 
but still the same exact principles still the same rules in so many words same everything if you go to the tanya chapter 8 he warns you that if you're going to waste your time speaking about sports surfing the internet chatting on facebook hey rabbi i have a few friends on facebook but i don't know if they're really listening to my rebukes what do you think i should do i think you should get off of facebook and go learn torah and if you can have friends bring them to learn torah with you and if they're only digital then simply go find real friends that you could actually learn Torah with and stop wasting your time in a digital world before you know it people are gonna build colors on on metaverse stop wasting your time on the internet stop chit-chatting and making fake friends on the internet go learn Torah that's your obligation in the world but people don't really understand until you tell them clearly multiple times and therefore the balatanya said it clearly multiple times throughout the tanya starting with chapter 8 which says simply for an idle conversation a person is going to have to go to kafakela and anyone that read ruchot mesaprot and looked at the commentary what he has what he wrote in chapter 88 literally your skin your skin will fall off from fear of the words that he's saying of what happens in kafakela awful of awfuls awful of awfuls nightmare of all nightmares what happens in kafakela the destruction that happens to sinners and the balatanya says that for a simple waste of time conversation a person goes to this place we're talking about having the Rabbi Udaftaya says destruction destroying angels or well, they're called destroyers they're called the uh, they're, 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 they're destroying angels these angels spoke to Rabbi Udaftaya they told him that they only have one desire they don't have a desire to love although they procreate they don't have lust they don't even have love for their own kids these specific destroyers they only have one lust to hurt the sinners that's the only thing they want to do that's their lust and each person in kafakela has three of them surrounding him bringing him from judgment to judgment from court to court Shem Yishmol, if you heard what happens, these Neshamot have different sentences with different parts of the day where they're literally punished in more severe ways than the worst possible horror films you could ever imagine. Beaten with fire and for the several hours straight, and if that's not enough, they're then taken to a specific place to go cut wood in order to make a fire to burn themselves and the angels watching them and then they re- resurrect them and they bring them back to court every day and the time in kafakela is the same as the time here and one woman that committed adultery a hundred times got a hundred years of kafakela and gave the details of her punishment to the smallest minor details you read this literally you get scared to death and start crying and if you don't you should check your pulse it talks about people that are regular people but all of a sudden they have all types of strange thoughts about christianity all types of strange thoughts about wanting to become an atheist Rabbi Yudavtaya says it's very possible and even likely those people have a dibuk in them. One of these neshamot in Kafakela entered them. Horrible of horribles. The Balatanya says for a waste of time conversation, a person goes to Kafakela. In chapter 8, beginning of the book. 
In chapter 25, he says, people waste a lot of time and they don't learn enough Torah. This is the reason why the sages instituted for us to say, I'm sorry for not learning enough Torah three times a day in our Amidah. If you look at the Tana, you see a monumental work that is constantly giving the same exact message as the rest of the sages. Work on yourself, perfect yourself in your servitude of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and do tshuva now. Now, not, not tomorrow, now do tshuva. Because the punishment is severe and the obligation is great. The same message we hear from Pirkei Avot, the same message we hear from Rabbi Yosef Karo, the same message we hear from the Rambam, the same message we hear from the prophets. The Balatanya was already saying tshuva now. When the Lubavitcher Rabbi Alava Shalom said Mashiach now, he wasn't veering away from the foundational teachings of Chabad being the Tanya, because surely the Tanya also wrote an entire book of laws of do's and don'ts called the Shulchan Aruch Arav, telling us these are all the things you need to do. You have to wash your hands, you have to eat kosher, you have to do this. Shulchan Aruch Arav, the Baal Tanya wrote, where perfecting yourself to do tshuva is sp- and serving a Kadosh Baruch Hu is in the Tanya, but the details of how to do it is Shuchan Aruch Arav, the do's and don'ts. If you do, all the good things that I mentioned are going to happen. If you don't, all the bad things that I mentioned are going to happen. And surely, not a single leader in Hasidut has ever said that only read the Tanya. Surely you have to go read the Gemara. Surely you have to go read the Chumash. Surely you have to read the Rambam. Surely you have to follow everything. Don't just make Judaism into one thing. We have an extraordinary Masoret, extraordinary obligation. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, Allah Shalom, was not veering away Chas Shalom from the foundation. The opposite. He was strengthening the message. By saying Mashiach now, all he was telling you is the same exact thing that the prophets were saying 3,000 years ago. Same message that the Rambam said 900 years ago. Same message that the Balatanya said a couple of hundred years ago. Do tshuva now. Why? Because the Mashiach could be arriving now. And if he arrives and you haven't done tshuva, you're a lost cause. There's nothing that can be done for you. So therefore, the whole message of Mashiach now is not go and put flags everywhere and make that into Judaism. No. The whole message of Mashiach now is to inspire people to do tshuva now because the Mashiach can come now. He didn't change Judaism. He simply strengthened the same exact message. He didn't tell you that the whole point of coming to the world was just to have babies. No, you have to fulfill what Rabbi Yochanan said, which is to be in the world and serve Hashem, following the mitzvot, because that was what was paskin ta'alacha. That's what the Rambam paskit. They paskit like Rabbi Yochanan. In Ilchot Yishut, chapter 6, Alachan number 5. And the Shulchan Aruch said the same exact thing. In Eben Ezer, the Siman uh, uh, um, 1 6. What happened is. Once the Lubavitcher Rebbe left this world, people simply started interpreting things according to their likings. Instead of really getting the true message of that Mashiach now is saying, do tshuva now, they've turned Mashiach now into a model that Mashiach now 
is going to solve all the problems. And then you could do tshuva. And then you could do this. And then you could do that. Yeah, but what about the fact that if he actually did come now, many people will be in the place that the Balatanya warned us about, this Kafakela place. Many people would be in this Genom place. And he mentions a Genom of snow, a Genom of fire. What about that? Well, if they did Shuva, they wouldn't have to worry about it. But if they just made their entire life into Mashiach now, then they're literally causing a damage to Am Yisrael. Rabotai Yekarim, this is not the first time this mistake is made. This is not the first time this mistake is being made. In fact, there was a mistake made at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. At the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, there was the tribe of Ephraim who left Egypt before the salvation officially came. They left Egypt. They ran away. They figured that now is the salvation. Mashiach now. But did you get that information from God? No. Did you get that information from a prophet in the name of God? No. So what made you decide that Mashiach is now? Because we want it now. Oh, so you make the rules because you want, therefore it will be. You became God. The tribe of Ephraim left Egypt and died in the desert. 900 years later approximately, the prophet Yechizkel in chapter 37, verse 9, Kadosh Baruch Hu brings them to the dry bones of all of these people that died and says to him, prophecy to the spirit, prophecy Ben Adam, and say to the spirit, thus says God the Lord, come, O spirit, from the four winds and breathe into these who were slain and they shall live. Kadosh Baruch Hu says to the prophet Yechezkel 900 years after they died. Prophecy and will bring them back to life. And that's exactly what happened where the bones were as dry as can be being in a desert there for 900 years. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought them back to life, put the flesh back on them in order to prove that there is going to be a resurrection of the dead to that generation and thereafter. But the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 92b, says, who are these people? Rav says, these were the children of Ephraim who calculated the time of redemption and made a mistake. And Shmuel says these were the ones who denied the resurrection of the dead. Meaning, the Gemara says that these people that died, these tribe of Ephraim that died in the desert, they were not tzaddikim. They calculated Mashiach now, and they were wrong. They denied part of the Torah. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu punished them and killed them in a desert. Rabbi Yudaftaya Kadosh says to us in chapter 88 of Minchat Yehuda, he says, so where were they for the last 900 years? Since they could not go to heaven and they couldn't even go to Genom, where were they? For the last 900 years, they were in Kafakela Shem Yishmor V'yatzil. Why? They said Mashiach now. They simply decided that this needs to be now. Why? Because I want it to be now. 
What about following the will of Hashem and teaching people about the 13 principles of faith? Instead of putting yellow stickers everywhere, says Mashiach, now why don't you put stickers that says the 13 principles of faith and remind the people that their donations will not be a replacement for observing Shabbat. Instead of building more buildings, why don't we use the money to help people learn real Torah that's going to help them do tshuva. Teach them that there is going to be a reward and punishment. And if they do not cover their hair properly, cover their body properly, eat properly, do business properly, observe Shabbat properly, Mashiach now is not going to help them. Mashiach will actually be the one that kills them. You see, Rabotai Karim, this is not an innovation or some new thing. This is simply something that existed in the past. And we have examples in a Torah that tell us this is not the way of Judaism. And I've spoken to a few real Talmidim of the Lubavitch Rebbe that were there, that were with them, that learned from them with many, many years. They don't say Mashiach now. Arab Zarnel, that was my dear friend, Allah Shalom. He says this nonsense would have never existed at the time of the Lubavitch Rebbe. Why? Because the whole point of what he was teaching is the same exact thing of what all of Judaism has been teaching. We're here in this world to serve Akadosh Baruch Hu. We're here in this world to serve Akadosh Baruch Hu. Why? That's our job. That's our role. Not to wait for Him to bring us to heaven. We're here in this world to earn heaven. We're here in this world to fulfill the mitzvot. Not to wait for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to pay our debt. We're here in this world to fulfill the entire Torah. Not to change it according to our likings. Those who changed it according to their likings, even if it was a minor detail. If it was Shlomit that simply decided that saying hello to anybody, it's not a big deal, even though it is. She got her deen. The son that came out of that rape also wanted to change it to us. Small minor detail. What's the big deal? I'm not going to tell anybody. Just add me to the tribe of Dan. No. And when he got to know, he went against God and ended up losing everything. Instead of learning how to cope with the laws and see that they are for your benefit, he decided that if you're not going to change the Torah for me, I want no part of it. Thinking that if he has no part of the Torah, there is going to be something better for him. When you deny the Torah, you deny yourself. Heaven, you deny yourself everything. But it's just a small detail. HaKadosh Baruch Hu looks at every minor detail. There is no small detail. When the prophet Jeremiah was saying to people warnings, this false prophet came and told people, ah, he's full of bad news. I'm going to give you good news. So what if he lies a little bit? That small little lie cost that false prophet his life that he died less than two months later and cost the entire nation of Israel to suffer further and even more than they were suffering before. The tribe of Ephraim decided that Mashiach now is the way to go. They ended up paying nearly 900 years of suffering in Kafakela. Each and every single one of them having destructive angels that have a desire to destroy them and to beat them as the only lust that they were created for. People love their opinion. 
But the moment you love your opinion more than a Kadosh Baruch Hu's, you're losing everything. As much as we would like for Mashiach now to really be what they say it is, it simply doesn't exist. The goal of the message that the Lubavitcher Rebbe brought was Mashiach now is tshuva now. Not Mashiach now and tshuva later. Mashiach now is tshuva now. Because if you do it later, it'll be too late. Perhaps, instead of sending me more messages and bothering many of my students and causing them untold harm, perhaps they should reflect and see that changing the Torah is to no one's benefit in the end. We have a track record of losers that changed the Torah and not a single one of them benefited in the end. Bezat Hashem this too will give chizuk to those that are looking for the truth. The sources are there and there's many, many more. All you got to do is open a book and you'll see it. With that being said, you guys will ask some questions and Bezat Hashem HaKadosh will give us some answers. I'm going to get a little drink. Love the ship. Jack saying the uh, that's the first question. Jack said the Rebbe said he did all he can to bring Mashiach. It's now up to you, right? He obviously in that statement alone, he's saying he's not Mashiach. So that means that the thousands of Chabadniks that worked very hard to publicize the 120th birthday of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, despite the fact that he died already 30 years ago, and that he is Mashiach, is obviously going against the Lubavitcher Rebbe's own words. Uh, honestly, I've, 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 uh, I've uh, spoken to some of these uh, Chabadniks and I believe that even if Moshe Rabbeinu came to them and told them who the Mashiach is, even if he told them that he is the Mashiach, they would say, no, Lubavitcher Rebbe is the Mashiach. Even if the Lubavitcher Rebbe would come back from the dead and tell him he's not Mashiach, they say, no, no, you are Mashiach. So uh, yeah, certain people that are simply just uh, uh, creating a new truth to such an extent that they're uh, you can't even show them anything else. And I have, as I'm speaking to you right now, I have different people, that the same ones that have been uh, spamming me with their messages, sending me messages as I'm speaking to you guys. Why does the Rambam say in Pekeh uh, Helek that you shouldn't take Agadah literally and call those people pathetic and tools? As any sage has explained, the Agadah on their hidden meaning. Of course, they, even the Gemara says, you can't, you can't take every single Agadah literally. There are some that you take literally. There are some that you don't take literally. Anyone that wants to learn the Pshat of the Agadot has to look at the Maharsha, has to look at what the sages discuss on them, because there are certain Agadot that if you were to take them literally, you would literally make the, uh, the Torah look stupid. For example, that there was a, a bird that uh, laid an egg and the leg, the egg uh, splattered and the uh, yolk uh, 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 covered the entire world. Now, obviously, this is not an Agadah to take literally. This, this is, there is a parable here to be taught. Furthermore, there are certain Agadot that have intentional hidden meanings in them there are certain teachings within Judaism that intentionally have meanings within them, and there are certain uh, uh, teachings that have literal and certain teachings that have both. You have the Pshat, Drash, Remes, Sod. You have the Pardes, okay? And uh, the, the uh, Chachamim talk about how a person has to learn Torah and get eventually to the point of learning Sod, because meaning you can't just learn the Pshat 
and say that's it that's the basic meaning of everything why because if you just learn the basic meaning of everything the Torah that you're going to have is going to be very very basic and there's going to be a lot of missing holes a lot of missing things a lot of things that are missing from the argument for example you have a uh, a question somebody has asked in one place in the Torah it says that a child is not going to die for his father's sin another place in the Torah it says that a uh, uh, the uh, uh, the opposite so how do you explain this contradictory messages very simple if you look at the basic uh, 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 meaning of it you'll see that the you have a contradiction but if you start looking at it from different aspects of uh, you talks about it also many sages discuss it in the Gemara the very basic meaning is that you have a uh, uh, one rule is that if the child is rotten if the child is rotten and he's a criminal you don't kill the parents because of him if he deserves a death penalty it's just him same thing if the parent is rotten if the parent is a criminal and you have to punish him and kill him fine but that doesn't mean you have to kill his kids not to kill his kids that's the very very basic meaning but then you go into the next layer the next layer talks about how if the uh, uh child if the father is a sinner but the child is righteous the child is righteous therefore that child will not be punished for the sin of his father but if the child is wicked just like his father and is continuing the sins of his father he'll be punished for both both you know he'll be double punished why because he should have learned he should have learned from his father what not to do not what to do so here you have multiple layers and there's obviously much much more but for the uh for the for the sake of time and uh it's important for us to know that it's you can't just learn the just the basics just the basics because you have pardes you have the the, the pshat the, the hinted message there you have the drash which is the behind the scenes message and then you have the secret meaning the sod now many people like to s- skip the first three and go right to the sod and those people end up being very very close to idol worshipers why because without the first three parts the sod is simply going to lead per- people to 100 percent heresy and this is not just me saying it this is the Arizal saying it this is the Gaon Mivilna saying it you can't just skip the first three and go to the mystical parts of Judaism it just doesn't work that way on the other hand a person that limits his learning intentionally limits his learning just to learn the the uh, uh the first three first three seems like a lot the Chida says that person is a is, is a period a period is a is a donkey why because he's missing the sod because once every time a person learns more another layer everything makes even more sense he starts filling in holes that he didn't even think there was a solution for it he didn't think that there was a uh, he didn't even notice the hole was so big he didn't even notice it was there until he got the answer for that hole and now it all makes more sense but then when he got another layer it makes even more sense so the more a person learns the more he's filling in the gaps and how the entire Torah becomes a spiritual nervous system that gives him sweetness for life sweetness to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, gives him the fear of the Almighty fear of, of the Almighty not just from the punishment but also from the awe of the Almighty and and also a love for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, a genuine love of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. most people when they say I love Hashem they don't really understand what love means because they think that if they say I love you to Hashem that means that you you love Hashem loving Hashem means that all you want to do is serve Hashem that means you're looking for opportunities to learn more Torah you're looking for opportunities to pray you're looking for opportunities for every holiday for every Shabbat for every mitzvah most people they look at the Siddur and they see it's 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 a long prayer they already get discouraged uh they already think oh it's a really long prayer maybe can I skip part of it already a person that that really really does cheshbon nefesh and sees how how they fulfill the mitzvot realizes how much lackings we have realize how much lackings we have so a person has to understand that in order to truly love the master you have to learn his Torah to the fullest and until a person truly goes through layer after layer he doesn't even know what love means he doesn't even know what loving Hashem even means and you and you see it you see it every time it's it's pathetic 
that people uh, are, are taught in such a fashion where they think that if they have uh, a mantra of some kind saying, I love you, Hashem, or whatever other mantra people are making this week, that, that uh, that's uh, serving Hashem to the fullest. It's, it's, it's nice, and I wish it was uh, uh, that easy, uh, but, uh, because less people would be going to Gehenom. But it's just simply that it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. There's, loving Hashem means serving Him to the fullest in every mitzvah, looking forward to prayer, looking forward for saying Birkat HaMazon, looking forward to doing a blessing so uh, you're, you're eating only for the sake of blessing, and so on and so forth. It's a, uh, and, and not looking forward to doing something because you'll get a reward out of it. You know, and, and that's, that's one of the things that most people, when they look at mitzvot, they look at it like an investment as far as what do I get for it now? Like a trade, like a trade. They look at it like a, like a, like a day trade. And uh, that's uh, 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 not the right way to look at things. But if that's the only way you can get somebody to get started, that's fine. But the point is to continue learning Torah to the point where a person starts looking for ways to serve a Kadosh Baruch starts looking for ways to uh, uh, pray more, to learn more, to do more, and uh, not looking for ways to uh, get out of, uh, uh, you know, everything. So the, the key is to understand that each part of these Agadot that you have in a Torah has multiple layers of teachings, and one of the most important parts that you learn from these Agadot is the behavior of the sages and also what fear of the Almighty and love of Hashem is in real life from those stories. Like how do you actually, what does real love of Hashem actually look like? What does fear of the Almighty actually look like in real life? I'll give you, I'll give you a, 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 a small examples the Chazonish had a, uh, a, a very, very uh, particular way of looking at everything in order to make sure that uh, everything that he put into his mouth was 100% kosher. So he had certain things that he would enact for himself that were stringencies that he would put for himself, such as that he would never eat in the dark. He would never eat in the dark. Why? He had to look at what he's eating to make sure that there's no worms, there's no uh, 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 issues with it. Most people, they only uh, realize that they have to do a blessing after they've already swallowed. But when somebody thinks about Hashem nonstop, they have literally a rule for themselves that they're not even going to allow themselves to eat in a place that they're not looking at things clearly. Now, what does this bring somebody? It brings a person a constant state of mind where he's thinking about Hashem at all times. And a special siyat dishmaya. There was one time where the Chazunish went to visit his sister, the Rabbanit Kanievsky, uh, and uh, she gave him some food. He ate all the food except the hard-boiled egg. After he finished the food, he picked up the egg. He looked at it carefully, turned it around, inspected it, and then put it down and didn't eat it. Simply decided not to eat it. Now, we're not talking about a time where there's an, a huge abundance and you could just simply give away food. And it's like today where you give your kids food and 85% of the plate is uneaten and it's no big deal. No, we're talking about a time where there's poverty is running the streets. So to leave an entire egg and not eat it is a big deal. But Chazonish looked at the hard boiled egg and decided not to eat it without opening it, without cracking it. Looked at it from the outside. Now, the Rabbanit Kanievsky knew that her brother didn't say anything. That's because he has kavod. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. But she's wondering to herself, why would her brother not eat egg? So after he left, she peeled the egg. And to her amazement, she saw that this hard-boiled egg had a spot of blood on it. She said, look at this siyat dishmaya that my tzaddik brother has that already his holy eyes can see that there's blood inside the egg. A hard-boiled egg. We're not talking about a, uh, you know, an egg you open, you put it in a bowl, you look. and you, No, a hard-boiled egg. That's a siyat dishma, it's a Kadosh Baruch Hu protecting a tzaddik that is protecting himself. Now, when it came to Am Yisrael, the, the, the amount of love that he had to, for Am Yisrael did not stop him from rebuking them. When it came to loving them, 
at the end of his life when he became very nearsighted very nearsighted and he didn't need glasses to read anymore but when he would go outside the chazonish would put on his glasses his talmidim asked him why are you wearing glasses he says because there are people that will at times say hello to me and if i don't see them they'll probably get upset that i don't care about their hello so to make sure that i see anyone that says hello to me and i can respond to them i put on the glasses i don't need the glasses for seeing i need the glasses to fulfill the i love my brother another mitzvah in the torah but at the same token when he saw that the farmers were violating shabbat it didn't stop him from rebuking them when he saw people were violating shemitah didn't stop him from rebuking them same with all of the great sages same with all of the great sages in fact there's a chag that's coming up lag baomer 24,000 students of rabbi akiva died during this time the gemara says that this was a period of time where the 24,000 students of rabbi akiva died because they didn't have honor for each other chachamim say they didn't have honor meaning they didn't rebuke each other so then the chachamim say wait a minute rabbi akiva why he didn't rebuke them he didn't know that they were say so, no no surely rabbi akiva did not know they didn't honor each other how do we know because there was one time there was one time a uh, uh one of the students they don't mention him by name of rabbi akiva that decided to make tefillin with instead of leather he made it the trellet fabric no one said anything surely if rabbi akiva would have saw it surely he would rebuke him and would not allow it to continue why it's rabbi akiva there's no reality where someone that has yirat shamayim doesn't rebuke there's no reality such as this someone has yirat shamayim rebukes why because he loves the jew and he rebukes him because he loves him the rebbe mitzans the klosenberg rebbe had a multi-millionaire brought to him that was bringing a check a multi-million dollar check in order for the Klosenberger Rebbe to build another hospital without thinking twice the Rebbe rebuked this guy in front of everybody for thinking that what he's doing with all of his money giving Tzedakah is going to be good for him because the money that he's using is money that he made from gambling and therefore all of the money that he's making is from cheating is from from uh, uh, from going against god it's considered you you win money in gambling it's considered stealing and in fact he'll be punished for every dollar that he donates from that gambling because that money that went to the yeshivot was impure money and therefore there was tum'ah tumor that was brought into the mouth that fed the mouth that ate in that yeshiva those kids those little kids they're not gonna have the purity of Torah because of his money they're gonna have impurity because of his money and he rebuked them with these words in front of everybody of course this rich old man ran away and when the Hasidim asked the Rebbe why why did you why did you do that we could have got we're supposed to get a big check from the guy the Rabbi Mitzan says to them, I'm not delusional to think that just because of what I said to him, he's going to change his life overnight and do tshuva. The point of my message was to at least help him not enjoy the sin as much. He's never going to enjoy the sin as much. Why? Because I love him much more than his money. Yeah, what about the hospital? Kadosh Baruch will bring that. There's no such reality as not rebuking. Why? Because that's the after So when it comes to the Agadot, you see, you see 
how the sages reacted in their day-to-day life. Different stories. You also see parables that are glamorous, that have hidden meanings in them, that are part of the sod of the Torah. So the Rambam is simply telling you, if you study the Torah in, a sim- in one way, surely you do not understand what Torah is. If you look at Torah as black and white, this is the only way to read it, like the Christians read, the Tanakh, like heretics read, they translate everything literally, he says they're fools, because the Torah is not literal, there's a lot more to the Torah, there's a lot more to the Torah, Kadosh Baruch looked at the Torah and created the world from it, you think that's going to come from from just basic meaning of everything come there's a lot more to it and is the same thing for the written Torah is the same thing for the oral Torah and that's the reason why you could have tzaddikim that dedicate their lives to the Torah and go over the shas dozens if not hundreds of times some of the gedolei ado I've, I've seen numbers of how many times they completed the shas four or five hundred times they completed the shas to, to complete the shots, 10% of that. Completed the shots 400 times. Why would you read the same set of books 400 times? Because every single time you read it, there's another layer. There's another layer of discovery. There's a whole new, it's, every time it's like brand new. Not because you don't remember everything that you've learned. Surely you remember everything you've learned. Just this time, because of everything that I've learned, I see another layer, another Another beauty, another diamond has been, has, been, has been found. When the more a person dedicates themselves into the Torah, the more they're able to see the, the, literally the hands of a Kadosh Baruch Hu in creation inside their lives, inside their own, their own day-to-day. And that's why anyone that looks at it literally is literally shortchanging Hashem, limiting Hashem, limiting His ability, calling Moshe Rabbeinu stupid. That's what, that's what, that's, that's in essence what the Gemara says on such people. It's like calling Moshe Rabbeinu stupid. If I didn't say it in the Gemara, I wouldn't be able to say such a thing. So it's, it's, it's people have to understand it. Torah is endless, but you can't go to the end and then go work backwards. Go to the sod, go to the secret part and work your work backwards. You have to start with pshat, you know, it goes in order. And Bezot Hashem, a person grows. Good question. Uh, okay, next. Uh, thank you for your teaching us. Can't attend a mixed dancing. Thank you for teaching us. Uh, can't attend a mixed dancing simcha. Not even only staying for the chupa, which I was unaware of. How come there are great rabbis who perform the wedding ceremony here and in Israel? And they leave before the dancing starts. Maybe if they refuse to perform the ceremony, it's better. Or they do not have a choice, since it's better to get married under halacha rather than with the reform or conservative rabbi. It's confusing. Please explain. Uh, now, as far as why a rabbi will, will uh, be a, a rabbi of a wedding uh, that is going to have mixed dancing, um, I can't speak on his behalf what uh, you know what information he has that is um, causing him to make such a decision so I don't know what's in their mind I don't know what they know I don't know maybe maybe they they are saying like what you're saying that they know this couple and they know that this couple is so far away from the truth that if he doesn't do the wedding they'll end up going to a reform or conservative or even to a church uh and they're afraid of that and therefore they say you know what at least do the wedding and run away before the dancing begins so that may be something that they are uh rationalizing uh it may be something uh, different it may be you know a million and a half other things either way it's a uh being a rabbi for doing the wedding and then running away is very different than somebody that's coming to a wedding and being part of it simply because to uh the, the rabbi is needed is needed and there's a risk if he doesn't come whereas the person that's coming to the wedding 
uh, he's not needed. There are other people coming to the wedding. So it's, it's a, there's, he, the rabbi may actually have, you know, uh, he has something to rely on. He's needed and there's a risk if he doesn't come. Uh, and whereas the people that are guests, they're, they're, they don't have anything to rely on because in essence, they are trusting that their Yetzirah is simply going to allow them to just leave exactly at the right time. And we learned from the Gemara in Masechet Baba Metziah, you're not allowed to uh, uh, have such confidence that you'll beat your Yetzirah that way. So therefore, you're not allowed to go to such a place. But uh, as far as why every rabbi does what he does, that you'll have to ask them. You have to ask them. Uh, I need a Noah Hyde community. You and the rest of the world it doesn't really exist. There are small little gatherings here and there uh, of different people that are like-minded. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, from all of the Noahides that I know, which are Baruch Hashem, quite quite a few, um, it's being a uh, you know being a Noahide is not uh, uh, something that uh, is um, a community thing. Meaning that uh, it, it's impossible. To, uh, to have a Noahide community that's kosher simply because there are too many people with their own ideas that they want to bring to the table and before you know it, they end up creating a whole new religion. To be a Noahide, you have to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu. If a Kadosh Baruch Hu uh, sees that uh, you need to have a, uh, a friend or, or two, he'll send them to you in one way or the other. But whether you have those friends or not doesn't really make much of a difference. You still have to serve Hashem the same. And uh, as far as having a community, uh, just think of the community you'll have once you leave this world as a righteous person. Uh, whether it's at the time of Mashiach or, uh, or a person dies beforehand. If they're righteous as a Jew, they go to heaven. If they're righteous as a non-Jew, uh, they go to heaven. Two different types of heavens, but nonetheless, heaven. So that's the best community in the world. Don't worry about the community in this world. Jeremy's asking, is it okay to plant potted plants for fruits or cactus this year? In Chutzlavetz. Yeah, there's the Shemitah is not here. Um, can I make Shiduch between a Shomer Shabbat singles, even though I know that some of them will not cover their hair after marriage and they wear pants? They only observe basics like Shabbat, Kashrut, Tarat, Mishpacha. I do try to do Kiruv with the singles, but sometimes it's challenging. Uh, to, make, uh, to make a Shiduch between two religious Jews that are keeping, like you're saying, they're keeping Shabbat is a mitzvah. You should definitely help them uh, do it. Uh, and uh, obviously uh, try to talk to people that are serious, that you know, are actually going to get married and not act like husband and wife for two years before they become husband and wife. Uh, so if they're serious and they observe Torah, then yes. As far as what they do after they get married, that's not something that you need to speculate in. You know, perhaps today, if they got married today, they wouldn't cover their hair, but who knows how much they'll grow, uh, you know, over the next six months, over the next year, over the next couple of years. So you don't have to worry about what sins they'll make or not make. The key is, if they're Jewish, they're observing Torah and mitzvot, and there's another Jew that's observing Torah and mitzvot, then, and you can help them get married, surely it's a, uh, it's a, it's a big mitzvah. I can tell you from experience, it is very difficult. Very difficult to get two people on the same page to get married because uh, people are very, very picky. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, and there is a, um, unfortunately, so much spiritual filth in people's minds of what they should expect from a husband or from a wife that it's almost impossible for people to look at uh, uh, anybody the right way uh, they uh, if they're not if they don't develop an immediate lust for the other person uh, then uh, you know typically they, there's no second date and uh, if they don't uh, see that this person can be of some type of uh, benefit for them in other ways, it's very hard for them to move forward. Like if a career opportunity, money opportunity, a uh, status opportunity, it's very strange. People are literally like a, uh, 
almost uh, I don't know, like they're uh, they're like uh, uh, scouts for you know they can, in, in in sports teams they have scouts that they send to different schools to go recruit new players for the new season and it seems like people today are acting like those scouts where they care less about who that person really is and what they do behind the scenes they simply just care about if they have the statistics that they require to fulfill some role they have so it's very hard to make shiduchim uh, and again people are very very picky you have people breaking off shiduchim over the dumbest things in the world if you can make a shiduch by two people then uh, surely you'll have uh, you have siyat dishmaya uh, Baruch Hashem, I've merited to do a couple of them uh, and I've tried uh, I hate it I, I truly hate it I only do it because uh, you know if, uh, if if I'm the last option and or that I simply it's clear to me that this is the case but sometimes even if I see something as clear as day I can't make the choice for people sometimes people are just uh, they're not uh, they're not ready they're not ready but they don't realize it so if you could help them surely it's a good thing but always remember if they're Shomer Shabbat now not if they're gonna be Shomer Shabbat sometimes people think like oh yeah he says he'll keep Shabbat once he gets married so it's okay no no it's not okay they have to be religious at that time they have to be religious at that time the uh, you know that uh and that's something that's important to know and as far as how much they grow in religiosity after they get married typically it becomes a little easier to grow uh once you get married um you know is, is to become more religious typically but you know for each don't uh jay's asking one question regarding of all the terrorism against uh, am israel is it allowed not only to eliminate them inside and israel but by logic extension the law of war uh eliminate all terrorists in different countries by the hands of the government uh well no government is uh willing to do such a thing um simply because this is the will of hashem hashem is allowing these uh terrorists to terrorize us uh it's a there's a rules in the world hashem said that uh the fight between esav and yaakov is a fight that will last until uh until mashiach comes uh when the mashiach will destroy esav uh and uh, there's a hatred that esav has that's within him uh to hate yaakov meaning that the uh the goyim have for am israel so this hatred is sometimes uh turned off or covered by the hand of hashem where it's not that they don't hate us it's just not an active hate at that moment but when am israel makes sins they have more homosexual uh, gay pride parades and they have more Hilul hashem and they pick a uh, 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 a guy that's not jewish but pretends to be a jew because he doesn't realize that his mom that converted reform is not really jewish and therefore he's not jewish but he pretends to be a jew with his little baby keep on the back of his bald head and he lies to all of the jewish people about what he's going to do and they make him into the prime minister then of course this is the will of hashem that he's fulfilling a prophecy that the leaders will act against the people same thing with the uh the, the curse in the torah parashat kitavo is that hashem is going to send a nation that's going to be among us that's going to terrorize us but this is not going to be a stronger nation he's just going to make them into a stronger nation that one of them will uh will uh, be able to uh, scare a thousand of us Hashem so now this is the will of Hashem does that mean that we should do nothing no first thing we should do is do tshuva that's the first thing we should do do tshuva but in regards to uh, uh the the alachic uh, uh, behavior towards a terrorist anyone that's coming to kill you it's a mitzvah to kill him first but if he wants to kill you but he's not coming to kill you right now meaning he is sitting somewhere in Germany in his living room thinking of all types of ideas of how much he hates Jews no you don't have a permission to go into his house and kill him but if he's already planning he's coming to to attack you and so on it's a different story so it's as far as terrorists anyone that's coming to kill us we have a Torah obligation to kill them first it's not a suggestion so the government that is making the soldiers scared to kill terrorists 
uh, is actually causing the terrorists to have uh, even more confidence because if you notice what happened in the last 24 hours, how upside down the, uh, the, the world is, how upside down the, uh, the government is, when it came to the, uh, um, the terrorists, some of the people that killed the terrorists, the Jews, the, the soldiers, were thrown into jail were uh, were uh, uh, put into uh, a court case and, and 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 literally the treatment that they gave the people that are protecting the jewish people was terrible on the other hand the terrorist that killed a few people is a there's a picture online that the soldiers are giving him a cigarette to smoke the police are giving him a cigarette to smoke he just killed a few people he's a murderer but they're giving this terrorist a cigarette to smoke on the other hand some reporter that got murdered apparently this reporter is a terrorist to herself that is part of a terrorist organization at least i don't know all the details but this is what i heard from a reliable source long story short this terrorist what did they do the americans condemned the people that killed this terrorist they didn't condemn the terrorists that killed jews in israel but they condemned that the uh, the, uh, the the you know the, the people that, that killed this uh, reporter so the point being is is that the world is upside down going and shooting people is not going to be the solution it's not the solution the solution is to do the will of hashem so hashem protects us that's it hashem protect us and uh that's going to bring more holiness to the world and that holiness is going to be the protection not only for yourself but literally for others that they are in his generation uh, one of the dibukim told him that there's literally 50 people 50 people 50 tzaddikim in the entire generation in, in, in his uh in, in baghdad that did not waste seed ever in their life and it's because of them that the entire jewish people and the entire world still has a right to exist like something unbelievable first of all it's unbelievable that there's only 50 people that didn't waste seed that were older already and the second thing that's unbelievable is that they how much Akadosh Baruch Hu loves those tzaddikim that he literally he gives the rest of the world a right to exist because of them so from there we see that the more righteous a person is the more they'll have an impact on the world around them you know many t- times people think oh if I can't help 500 people do tshuva every single day what good is my mitzvot no no you don't realize you doing the mitzvot and perfecting your servitude of hashem that in itself creates a certain amount of holiness in the world that is protecting jewish people that is protecting the 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 world from being destroyed altogether so there is surely if somebody's doing kiruv and helping people it's even more kedusha it's the highest level of chesed but guns knives the weapons that's the ways of the uh, of, of of the uh, heretics that think that their guns and their knives and their tanks are going to solve the problems that's not our way our way is what Moshe Rabbeinu did even if you have to go to war for every thousand soldiers that are, have a knife and a gun and everything in their hand you have a thousand people learning Torah why because that gun that knife that tank that uh, that airplane that missile is only going to be used the right way and arrive at the right destination if you have somebody that's learning to love backing him not because the the weapon is advanced and the weapon is uh no it's all because of Torah. it's all because of mitzvot so our goal is to create more holiness in the world and that's going to be the protecting uh for us and for the rest of Ami Slayers of the shit uh They are is asking uh, as Psalms more effective if read in Hebrew, even if we don't understand. What about Amida? Uh, what should be read in the language uh, we understand? Um, there is a uh, special significance to uh, reading the Chumash uh, in a uh, the uh, the language of Hebrew. Uh, it's very very important to read it in the uh, language of Hebrew uh but you have to know what you're saying meaning that if you're just making the sound and you have no idea what you're saying then no you need to uh you need to know what you're saying so you need to first read it and study it 
in a uh, your language to the point where you're already understanding some of the Hebrew. But uh, if uh, uh, if you're reading it in the uh, uh, language of uh, your first language, you actually understand it. That's priority. But if you could do both at the same time, like you have one side is Hebrew and one side is your language, that's uh, that way is uh, is uh, is best. But if you have one option or the other, then surely your language. Same thing with Tehilim. Uh, same thing with uh, with uh, Amida. You need to understand what you're saying. So if you have to choose only one, then your first language is priority. But the the, the beauty of the world today is that Hakadosh Baruch Hu made everything very easy, very accessible, very cheap, and typically it's not too difficult to get both uh, to be side by side, either in a book format or you could print something out. So you could do both. Now, as far as one thing that has uh, extraordinary value to be read in the language that it was written is the Zohar. Uh, and even if, and most likely, if the person doesn't understand what he's reading, the Zohar already, Chachamim already know it, that most people that read the Zohar, specific parts of it, are not going to understand anything. But reading uh, uh, some Zohar, some Chachamim uh, uh, were very adamant about uh, People reading a few pages of Zohar every day, I believe it's five pages of Zohar, maybe a little less, of Zohar, even if they don't understand a single word. Why? Because the Zohar was given a special merit that it fixes certain sparks within the, uh, certain things within the Neshama. Now, again, is this priority over learning Gemara? No. Is this priority over learning Chumash? No. Is this priority over learning Halakha? No. You have to do all the other things, and if you can, add those few pages of Zohar, if you can. But, uh, you know, this particular thing is, again, one of those things that is misunderstood in the world. You have people that don't even know what parasha it is this week, don't even know how to observe Yom Tov the right way, don't even understand what to check in an egg if you're about to cook it, but they decide to skip everything and go to the Zohar. So... That's not, that's not what anybody ever uh, meant. It's, a person needs to know that there is, the basics are the priority over everything. The basics are the priority over everything and then you add to it. But as far as when you're reading certain things, if you can read the prayer in, uh, uh, in Hebrew and understand most of it, you're good. You're, stay that way. Stay with the Hebrew. But if you only know how to make sounds, you don't understand anything at all, then you need to study the prayer, just like you study Torah, just like you watch the shiur. Go through blessing after blessing, see what this blessing means. So once you read it a few times, then you could go back to reading it in Hebrew again, because this time, even though you won't necessarily know exactly which word means exactly which, you'll have the basic meanings, and it'll help you read it in Hebrew and still understand the, uh, uh, the, the words enough to have kavanah. But to simply just purely make sounds without having any understanding whatsoever, that's not the goal. And that's why we have to learn every day, and this is no less. This is, you know, a person needs to learn uh, how to pray. Uh, and uh, such a, we succeed. Uh, so he's asking, what's gula of the rashash? What material is the kiddush cup on your website made of? Oh, the skula of the rashash, that's actually mentioned on the website. That's the skula, it's the whole details of it is, uh, is on the website, the whole explanation of it. Um, this is to looking at specific uh, names of holiness uh, on that cup after Havdalah. If you use that cup for Havdalah, uh, it, uh, it gives blessings of Parnassah and pretty much everything uh, that's good uh, for that week. Uh, and uh, it's, it's serious stuff. It's not an easy uh, uh, skula to do, but it's... Uh, very serious gula, very, you know, has serious sources. Now the cup itself, um, I mean, I'm not a, exactly a, a material expert, but I believe the cup is made out of glass. And the, uh, uh, but it has, it's wrapped in a certain foil of some kind, gold or, or, uh, or silver, uh, two different colors. 
and it has the Shemot Kodesh, the, the, the specific names, uh, holy names on them, uh, in a very, very beautiful way. Uh, and uh, Hashem, it's a very nice, uh, very nice thing. And uh, everyone that's seen it has loved it. My wife, Baruch Hashem, uh, she, uh, she, she was the buyer of, the, of, of, of uh, more than a few. <laughs> she, she said, it's, it's one of those things. Well, also, I'm, 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 not, I'm not allowed to touch them whenever I want, even the cups. My wife likes them so much. Uh, but they're, uh, Baruch Hashem, they're uh, beautiful things that uh you know have have uh have some uh connection to 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 holiness uh, to say the least and one of the nice things that i liked also that may not may or may not mean something to people but uh is that you don't have to take these cups to the mikveh because they were actually uh, uh made by jews in eretz israel and that part was already taken care of and that's actually also written on the box that uh you don't have to take this uh these cups or the uh little uh, coaster that it's on or plate or whatever it's on uh to the mikveh again I know some of you may like to go to the mikveh to dip your stuff but uh for the, <laughs> for the sake of saving time uh it's uh I think it's uh, it's kind of cool all right um let's see next question I'll try to get back to your question because I see some other people ask questions that haven't answered them. Uh, okay, Joshua is asking, is someone allowed to go to a wedding within the year of their parents passing away? Uh, no. No. What's the best method for timing of giving masel? If someone's earning fluctuates throughout the year, also, should Maser be calculated after household expenses and not allowed to uh, deduct any expenses? Um, the way that I do it, uh, I think is the best way, not because I do it, but rather because I've seen it to be the most effective uh, and uh, the, the best way to deal with the Yetzirah. Now, when a person thinks theoretically that uh, if they give, let's say, for example, they make, I don't know, let's say they make 500 bucks a week. Okay, so if they give Marcel, it's $50, and they figure, what's $50 going to do for this, you know, kolel? What's $50 going to do for the rabbi? What's $50 going to do for, you know, let me wait until I uh, work, uh, you know, six months. I'll collect all of the $50 and then give everything together. And then you have, you know, a nice, uh, a nice piece of, a uh, nice, nice investment. You have a few thousand dollars. That's theoretically how it works, but it doesn't work that way. Why? Because to give $50 is much easier than to give a few thousand dollars. And the same thing goes if somebody makes, let's say uh, they, they work off of, let's say commissions or they own a company and they calculate things once a month. Okay. They calculate things once a month and uh, at the end of the month or whatever it is, they see, okay, let's say they made uh, $10,000. Okay. Now they say, oh, $10,000, write a check for a thousand bucks, you know, give it to a tour organization. It's nice, but it's much nicer if I could just donate $12,000 at the end of the year. Why? Because if I give $12,000, then the, 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 the rabbi could really do something with it, or the shul can really do something with it, or the poor people can really do something with it, because it's going to be significant. But if I give them a thousand bucks, it's, you know, what are they going to do? That's theoretically. Reality is, don't do that. What you should do is you should give the way I do it. As soon as I get money in my hand from anything, I give myself. Okay. Now there are two different types of money. Okay. That the way I look at it is that uh, I have digital money and there's, you know, physical money. If somebody gives me physical money, let's say, for example, I have a lecture. Okay. Sometimes at the lecture, people put stock in a box or sometimes they give it to me in, uh, you know, myself. And, you know, I go home and I have whatever I have immediately before I put it in, 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 in any drawer or any closet or any account or anything. Before I do anything, I count exactly what's there. I take out 20% out of it. I put it in my stocker box. I got a big blue stocker box and I put it in there. Why? Because that money is not mine until I took out 20%. Now, I choose to give 20%, but, you know, you could start with 10 if you're not, uh, if you're just starting out. Either way, it's good. 
ten percent. A uh, Galmi Vilna says ten percent. When a person gives ten percent, the money will be protected. They won't lose their money. If uh, they give twenty percent, they'll be uh, rich. Shem will give them rich and uh, well, uh, will give them wealth during their lifetime. Uh, so the uh, but it's a very big test. Why? Because there's like you said, income fluctuates. One time you have this, another time you have that. So uh, so the 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 real money I give right away. Digital money, on the other hand, it's I typically give only once a month, the same exact date every month. I calculate what I got and I send it to the uh, uh, to to the Avrech, uh, you know, Bnei Torah, and I give my uh, my homage that way. Calculate what digital money was sent to me on this one, on whatever it is, PayPal, Venmo, whatever I did, and I send the money, the twenty percent from that, on the same exact date every single month, uh, no matter who, what, when, and how. Now. This is the way I do it because the, uh, 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 rather than doing it as soon as I get the money with digitally for two reasons. Number one, uh, it's going to take my whole day. If, if I get, if let's say a few people uh, send money, if I have to constantly calculate to give, uh, to give my share and then send it and so on, it's going to take up a lot of time. Number two, I don't look at money the whole month. So I don't look at, like at my bank account every day. Or, 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 I don't know, some people look at their stock portfolios or they look at what they got, what they don't got, what they owe. I don't look at anything. I look at everything once a, once a, a, a month. So even at the, the organization, like as far as like donations and stuff like that, I have no idea what people donated, like how much money we, we, we collected for the month or anything until the end of the month. All I know is a couple of times a, uh, uh, uh every week i have to pay bills i have to pay this i have to pay salaries i have to pay vendors i have to pay all types of things so paying doesn't require me to look at balance and what's coming in or anything else as far as what came in and uh things like that i only look at it once a month just to know where things stand and the same goes with my own personal stuff i only look at things once a month and the only reason i look is because i need to you know write a check to go pay my rent uh and so on so I don't need to calculate the maser every single day I, uh, and be afraid that I won't give it because it's a bigger amount or a smaller amount because I don't even know what I have until it's after the fact. It's after the fact. So, you know, whereas with physical money, physical money, it's, uh, sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a uh, bigger yetzalah, so the, uh, a person should give it as soon as they have it. Digital money, if you look at your accounts on a regular basis, perhaps you want to do it every time you get the money. So for me, I consider it as if I only get money once a month and I give money once a month because I only look at it once a month. But if somebody doesn't necessarily operate that way, they're one of these people where they look at their accounts on a regular basis, they get paid, let's say, I don't know, every two weeks. They get a paycheck every two weeks. And uh, then my suggestion is to give money as soon as you get paid because you know where, what, you know, you're a lot more active when it comes to that. You should give money as soon as, as, soon as it's made. Now, as far as what expenses to deduct from it and what expenses not to deduct from it, my suggestion is not to deduct anything. You have money, write the check from that money. That's my suggestion. You don't have to listen to that suggestion. There are certain things that you're allowed to, 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 to deduct. Okay, you're allowed to deduct. Uh, uh, but it's, so it's, you, Generally, it's the cost of doing business, meaning... If you, let's say, for example, you sold a car for $10,000, obviously the car cost you something. Let's say the car cost you $8,000. So the real profit there is $2,000. You didn't make $10,000. You have $10,000 in revenues. So that $2,000 profit, take the uh, ma sale from that. That $2,000. Why? Because it actually cost you $8,000 to make that $2,000 profit. So therefore, you write the mass, you deduct that cost. But people that start deducting their rent and then they deduct their, uh, I don't know, uh, their food and their gas money and all this other stuff, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, I don't think it's the right approach uh, from what I've learned and from what I've seen. And quite frankly, when you make it so complicated, to uh to uh you know to to calculate maser it just adds to the yetzara and decreases from the emuna now you're gonna say wait but if i calculate from the gross 
you know, and it's not, uh, again, if it's obvious, like for example, like I just, the example I just gave you, like the cost of the car is 8,000 and you sold it for 10,000, that's an obvious cost you can deduct without a problem, even using my shita. But if it's like other things like your rent and your electric and your water bill and your shoes and the lunch and the gas and your friend's lunch, you know, once you start deducting all these different things, before you know it, you're not going to have anything, any money left to, to actually give maaseh. That's what Rav Avadiyah said. So the, the uh, ideal is, is to give uh, the uh, gross profit. From the gross profit, to give from there the maaseh. That's the, the, the ideal. If you start talking about net profit, after deducting everything else, usually you're not going to have much left to give maaseh. Uh, but also, you know, it's, it's, it's a much bigger test because it's a larger amount of money every single month. So yes, there are months, and Baruch Hashem, those months happen often where I have a certain amount of money that I got. I, before I pay my, my rent, I already take out the, the, the Chomesh out of it. I take out the shit that just happened this past month. This past month, uh, so I just paid the bills you know, like a week ago. So this past month, I, uh, I did the calculation. I took out the money for the Chomesh, sent it Baruch Hashem for the Torah, after that, I realized, oh, wait a minute. Oh, look at that, Baruch Hashem. I didn't even have money to pay rent. Now, nah, Baruch Hashem, don't have to worry. According to what I got, I didn't have enough money to pay rent. The, the, the money after I paid the Chomesh was not enough money to pay rent, meaning that I lost money in so many words. But I didn't lose any money. Why? Because the Kadosh who gave me extra the month before, and this and that, and Baruch Hashem, there's plenty, and we have everything we need. But the way it calculated on a real-time basis that had I not paid the Chomesh, I would have had more than enough to pay the rent. But because I paid the Chomesh, I didn't have enough money to pay the rent. But that's only how the Yetzirah comes. Why? Because sometimes I have more than enough, less than enough, but at the end, there's always plenty. So that's just different tests. Those are different tests. And I love those tests as hard as they are because it helps me connect to HaKadosh Baruch It helps me work on myself. It helps me get a reality check that everything comes from Hashem. So that's why the suggestion is to not do so many calculations. Simply, you have a gross amount that you got. If there's no real cost of doing business, like an actual product cost, simply take the percentage that you decide, whether it's 10 or 20%, from that amount and send it out right away to Torah without waiting, without doing anything. As soon as you know this is where it's at, send it out as soon as possible. That is something that Baruch Hashem have been doing for years already. And Ishtabach uh, Shimon A lot of uh, things have, uh, have, have changed in our lives in a very, very positive way. I can tell you that from a personal basis, there was uh, times where we literally uh, uh, had no idea how we're going to close the month, how we're going to close the week. But Kadosh Baruch always made it so. But today, Baruch Hashem, we live with uh, everything that we could possibly ever want. Uh, I've... Uh, uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu has given, I've seen the blessing, I've seen the blessing for my own life. And I know some of the naysayers, the Rashaim, the wicked people, they think that I'm becoming a millionaire by taking uh, the, the organization's money. Little do they know, I don't even take a salary from the organization. It's a, uh, it's mamash, we live off of a miracle. But yet, oh Hashem, we have everything that we need and more than we need. So why? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu promises certain things. You have to get tested from time to time. You have to pass the test. You have to do everything you can. And Kadosh Baruch does what he does. But uh, if a person starts overanalyzing things, uh, they, they ruin the blessing. They ruin the blessing. So the two big suggestions is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the timing of things and I think the, uh, the way to give. I think that's the two biggest. But whatever you got out of it, hopefully is going to help you in your life. And everybody else. Uh, does adopting children fulfill the mitzvah of procreation? No. Um, uh, we have a blessing for refuah shlema, parnasa, and strength to defeat the Yetzirah. May all of you uh, have a bracha, atzlacha, chayim arukim, shlemim, edeim, Torah, mitzvah, begnut chazanim. Parnasa tova, refuah shlema, bezat Hashem. Matt's asking question, is it allowed to take decisions by asking Hashem a question then randomly open the Torah? To get answers, which is the best country to go in? Or, oh, the second question: to go and convert. Uh, oh, so there is a uh, um, there is a sgula by uh, by the Gaon Mivilna. 
uh, where you, uh, if you have a certain question, it's a very big question, that a person can do certain things and then open a certain place in the Torah and uh, know exactly what the answer is from Shemaim. But it's not as simple as people think where you could just open the Tanakh wherever you want and whatever the verse is, is that. No, no, there's a whole preparation process to it uh, that you need to do. It's fasting and uh, certain prayers. And then after that, it's actually knowing which verse. So there is no simple uh, system of just opening the Tanakh and uh, thinking that the first verse is what Hashem is saying. No, it's not. There is a process, but it's not as simple as as just opening the book whenever you feel like it, regardless of what question, and that's the answer. No, no, there is not only that. There is a process, but it's much more complicated than that. Uh, And uh, the tzaddikim that use it only use it rarely because of, of how difficult the preparation is. I've seen it happen. I've seen it in my own eyes. It's a, uh, it's, it's not an easy process, hence the reason that even the Gdole Ado that have used it only used it rarely, rarely. Uh, it's like uh, the uh, Urim Vetumim of this generation and the previous generations uh, were not used prob- probably, the, the women told me at the time of the Bet Mikdash. They were not used on a regular basis. They were only used at specific times uh, to go to war or not. But uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, um, uh, this skula, or whatever you want to call it, of the, of the Gaon Vilna, is, it works. I've seen it work, but it's not something that you use regularly. And it, there's a preparation process. Uh, Michael's asking, how should we celebrate or what should we do on Pesach Shani since we already observe Pesach proper? No, I mean, it's not a, uh, you don't have uh, obligations to do the same thing as you did in the first one. I mean, you can have, I think, uh, a dinner with the family and, you know, but there's no, like, a specific uh, alachot that uh, obligations for uh, Pesach Shani and this generation. So, uh, Alan's asking, we built the pyramids, who built the pyramids in Egypt? Who built the pyramids in Egypt? Who else would it be other than Ami Sled? Not really understanding. Who else? Who who else would it be? Aliens? Like the TV show say, Ami Sled. Ami Sled was slaves in, in in Egypt for two hundred and ten years. What? Uh, who 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 do people think actually built them? Um. I heard that a person who does the sin of Pekam Ablit can do a tikkun by studying Torah intensely because what created the soul is the thought and if someone is poor could someone use tikkun instead of money? Um, If someone is poor then it doesn't matter what the answer is. If someone is poor and they don't have any money That means that they don't have the ability to do a tikkun with money. So it's a irrelevant irrelevant circumstance. Either way, they have to learn Torah, whether they're poor or rich. Um, And if if they have money, then they can also learn Torah and give money. But if they're poor and they don't have money, then the tikkun of money is irrelevant for them anyway. So what's the point? Now, the truth is that you need more than just learning Torah uh, to completely do a tikkun. Um, but it's, a, uh, it's not necessarily uh, something that he has to do on day one. He can do whatever he can do now and continue. And if Hashem opens up the gates of heaven for him to do more, uh, in the future, then I'll do more in the future. Uh, how long should you recite Tikkun Klali? How long should you recite Tikkun Klali? Until you start doing real tshuva. The whole point of Tikkun Klali is to inspire a person to do real tshuva and stop the actual sin. Tikkun Klali is not actual tshuva. Tikkun Klali is to inspire the soul to do tshuva. Daniel is asking, are 
there are people in this world that didn't come to do tikkunim, but instead came as background actors, so to speak. Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, it's an interesting question. Yes and no. The uh, reason why I say yes and no is because uh, your definition of people. When you say people, uh, that you probably mean like you, like me, like uh, like people that actually have a mission in the world, it's to, to believe in God, to serve God, and so on. If that's what you mean, people that actually have a soul, uh, then no, there's no such thing. All of them came to this world to do tikkunim, to fix something, to serve Hashem, uh, to fix mistakes that they've made in the past, and so on. But if you're referring to uh, a, a people that are don't actually have a soul that are a uh, um, that are uh, how do I say this uh, demons that are not real they're not people that uh, are uh, uh, they're demons then then those people are uh, they're not background actors but they are uh, they don't have they're not here to do a tikkun they're here to be used as uh, different tools in the world and the Gemara says that there is uh, three you know multiple different types uh, some that are demons that are completely spiritual some that are part man part spiritual and some that are look like men and uh, they uh, um, procreate and eat but surely they you know they're not people that you know learn to and do mitzvot uh, so there are certain people like that uh, but this is not something that's really relevant to your day-to-day -day life. It's just simply mentally stimulating, I would say. Uh, generally speaking, the people around you are, uh, you know, here to do a tikkun, but it's not just the people, it's everything that's around you. Uh, if you actually were able to see with spiritual eyes, uh, you will see, you would actually see the souls in everything, and you would see that it's very likely that the apple that you have in the room has a soul in it, not all the time, but sometimes. And sometimes the bird that's outside, the six birds, sometimes two, three, four of them have souls of people in them. Sometimes the wall has it. Sometimes the rock has it. Sometimes the, uh, different things have it. Uh, and uh, in the Sefer Luchot Mesaprot, uh, the, the Dibukim are telling Rabbi Yudaftai different things that are in the room with him that uh, are being reincarnated as different things. In one particular example, there's a woman that had to be reincarnated to do a tikkun uh, because she didn't uh, cover her hair, uh, you know, uh, properly. Not a whole life, just uh, a one-time occurrence where she uh, took off her kisurosh outside in front of people uh, so she could fix it, but it was in front of people. That was not a husband. And for that, yes, she had to re be reincarnated uh, to do a tikkun. In something uh, that wasn't, uh, you know, uh, human. So there are things everywhere. There are creatures everywhere. There are creations of a Baruch Hu everywhere. But uh, you know, there are also, uh, you know, there's also our job, which is really the priority we should have. Next, did you notice? that lately every week another Chabad house is burning down. Is that a coincidence? There is no such thing as a coincidence, but I did not notice that every week a Chabad house is burning down. No. Last question. Uh, is it allowed to learn Musar at night? What's the deal with not reading Teilim at night and Tanakh? And why is it not good to do such things, especially since it's Talmud Torah? Ah, okay. So... The, the Talmud Torah and reading Tehilim or reading Tanakh are two different things. Talmud Torah means to study Torah. When Chachamim said reading Tehilim or reading the Chumas, that is just simply reviewing things, just to look at things, just to read it superficially. And that is, uh, there are specific times during the day that it's encouraged not to do it. But that's only with the writings of the Torah, not all of Torah. So let's let's break it all down. First, we'll start off with what is a uh, uh, not allowed or not recommended, uh, and why. So the writings of the Torah, such as the Chumash, uh, or like uh, things like Teilim, should not be read at uh, from the time of Arvit 
until Chatzot. But the, here I'm referring only to reading it superficially, not reading it for the sake of studying it and looking at commentaries and trying to understand a deeper meaning. No, I'm just talking about reading superficially. That, it's not recommended to doing it uh, during that time between Arvit and Chatzot. Chatzot is the middle of the night. You know, right now I think Chatzot in, a, in where I am is around 1 a.m., but it changes during the year. Uh, but either way, it's a, um, a person needs to uh, uh, know that this is a time, this window of time between Arvit uh, to Chatzot is a time where the mazikim, the spirits uh, the, uh, uh, the, of, of impurity are, uh, have extra strength. And uh, this would um, taunt them. Let's just say that. Reading this superficially would taunt them and it can bring damage to a person. It could be, it's like, for example, you have a, uh, a pit bull walking around or he's, uh, you know, and, and you're just slapping him in the face a few times. So, yeah, he may not do anything or he may bite you. Okay, so it's a, uh, it's, it's, so, but that is only if you're reading it superficially. What about the rest of Torah? The rest of Torah, such as Musal, such as a uh, Alakha, such as Gemara, there is no such thing as reading it superficially. It's even if you're not re- uh, studying it deeply, you're still the, the nature of the text is is is, is studious is 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 for the p- purpose of scholarship. It's not telling you stories uh, of of uh, A, B, and C. It's telling you certain things that you could easily connect. Uh, 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 to your life and uh, to, to the world naturally without necessarily even requiring always a lot of effort. So, Gemara, Alakha, Musa is something you can do 24 hours a day throughout, uh, uh, throughout the majority of the year. Musa, you can do the whole year, including on Tisha B'Av. Whereas the other parts, uh, Tisha B'Av, you're forbidden from doing it. Now, as far as studying, studying the Chumash or Teilim or, or Tanakh, that you can do 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day you can do it. Because studying the Chumash, reading the commentary, the Midrashim, the, uh, the, the, the inner meanings behind things, the halachot that are connecting to it, that's studying Torah. So that is something you can do 24 hours a day. But the, uh, 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 if you're just reading superficially, for example, if somebody is a, uh, uh, just, you know, likes to read the weekly parasha, uh, just like it's a storybook, don't do it during that time window. But if you're wanting to study the parasha, that you can do whenever you want. Next thing is in regards to reading Teilim. Reading Teilim, typically when people read Teilim, it's either because they've put it at it as a like sort of a sgula to add to their life to connect to Hashem to be another form of prayer to Hashem or it's a time of problems where they're in essence uh, uh, pleading with Hashem to help them at that particular time sometimes people do both sometimes they have a certain set of tehillim they read every single day such as there's a seder there's a certain uh, way that you can read tehillim every day and finish the entire book of tehillim once a week there are also ways you can finish the whole thing once a day, but most people can't do once a day, but you could, everybody could do once a week. Simply, you're averaging about 20 tailing per week, uh, per day, uh, you know, half hour a day, you could finish the whole tailing once a week. There's a period of time, Baruch Hashem, years ago, that I used to do that and uh, read a lot of tailing. So, uh, especially when I was still in New York, I used to read a f- lot of tailing after prayers, and it's very, very good for your neshama. But the... Uh, uh, something like Tehillim, if you're reading it as part of your daily order, do it during the day. If you're reading it as something bad happened or you need Hashem to help you at this moment, okay, that you could do anytime. For example, if there's somebody in the hospital or there's an issue of pikuach nefesh or there's some type of trouble, that you could do anytime, including that window of time where it says don't do it. Why? Because you're at a time of need, everything, all bets are off. Now, what about a person that if they don't read Tehillim or they don't read uh, the Chumash superficially, 
Instead, they're going to end up watching TV or they're going to end up playing cards or they're going to end up uh, wasting time. Then those people, they should read Tehilim, you know, or Chumash and whatever they need to do, just don't do the nonsense. So if a person can do something, either read Tehilim or, or uh, which is Psalms or Chumash superficially during that window of time or study Musar, watch one of our lectures, study Gemara, then surely the latter is better. The lecture, the Gemara, the Halakha, uh, that's better than to read the Chumash at that time. But if he's studying, if he's studying, he can study at any time. But if he's not going to study, and he doesn't want to read the Gemara, and he's either going to read Tehilim, or he's going to waste time, then he should read Tehilim and don't worry about it. Because if he reads Tehilim, he may annoy the, uh, the Mezikim. But if he doesn't read Tehilim, uh, and he ends up going to watch TV, he's going to create Mezikim, and that's much, much worse. So uh, that's the complete order uh, and priority list, I believe, to the question. Uh, okay, last question. Uh, how can a Noahide find another Noahide to marry her? What do you recommend on a Noahide uh, on how to find someone? You have to find somebody that's a like-minded person. Uh, typically, uh, there's going to be things that uh, you have in common. Either you will listen, you you are I don't know either part of the same community or uh, you're uh, you go to the same uh, lectures. Uh, honestly, more than anything else, pray about it. Pray that a kadosh baruch hu sends you somebody that's a decent human being. Uh, and sometimes you uh, have people that are decent human beings, but they just don't necessarily, they're not exactly there where you want them to be. Uh, sometimes you have to work on them, but there's no like uh, foolproof system that this works and uh, that's it. You know, so it's a, uh, uh, you, need, you need a little more than that. Uh, okay, going back to one of these questions, I think I told you I'll bring it back to you. Okay, here we go. What book in English would you recommend to me to send as a gift to my newlywed cousin? She's completely secular. She really does not know how much Judaism, uh, much about Judaism. I was hoping she would be inspired to do tshuva. Uh, a person that is not um, familiar with Judaism at all, unless they're an avid reader, I wouldn't send them a book. If they're an avid reader, they read books already, then yes, yeah, send them a book. You could send them, uh, depending on the language. Uh, if it's English, you could send them uh, the, uh, the book by Rabbi Mizrahi. You could send them the book by uh, of, um, uh, Nisim Yagen. Uh, you could send them the book uh, by Rabbi Zamir Cohen, The Coming Revolution. It depends on the person. Depends on the person. If they're, if they're uh, uh, scientific-minded, philosophical, uh, but also, again, they need to be a reader. Like, people just give people books uh, assuming they'll read it, but if the guy never read a book in his life, it's usually not the best way to, uh, to get them to start doing tshuva. Usually, it's better to send them a video uh, or give them a USB of some kind they can listen to because that's more in line with what they're already doing. You know, pretty much everybody's watching videos of some kind or uh, listening to something of some kind, music, whatever, they're listening to watching something. Uh, so it may not be them watching Torah, but surely they're watching something or somebody. So if you give them a video, uh, uh, it's, it's usually better than giving them a book, unless they're a reader. Unless you know for sure that this person actually reads on a regular basis, they make time, you know, each day or, or you know, to, to, to read, uh, then yeah, give them a book. Uh, but it depends on the person. It depends on the person, if they're young, if they're old, uh, my, you know, one of the things that I give people is, uh, is a, a Kiruv package that has several different types of books and so on. But I don't recommend people send these Kiruv packages to just anybody whenever. Like it has to be somebody that's interested already, just doesn't know, needs the information, but he's interested or she's interested. And the reason why is because if somebody's not interested at all, then the uh, when they get so much so many books and so many things it becomes almost overwhelming like it's just so much stuff they end up just putting it in some closet it's like people that buy uh, you know these these get rich quick schemes uh, on the internet 
and uh, you know they, they they buy this stuff, they get a package, and uh, uh, you know you get I don't know, five, ten books and fifteen CDs, and you just spent five hundred dollars on this thing, and what ends up happening? Nine out of ten people just put it in a closet and never look at it, past the first two pages. Why? It's just so much stuff. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. So when is it good? to send that cue package after somebody's already interested because they've watched several videos, they've added it to, the, to their daily life, and they want more. So if the person hasn't gone to that point, then I would recommend going with a video before a book unless they are an avid reader already. They read all types of books, self-help books, and, and, and uh, I don't know, philosophical books and scientific books, and they're a reader. Uh, read books about the market so they're a reader so you could connect to them something that's relevant to them but if they're not a reader I would recommend a video okay Rabotai Karim I think we went over Baruch Hashem a lot more than typical but Baruch Hashem was good I got a chizuk out of it uh, um, uh, for those of you that are thinking in the back of the mind what else is there in Kafakela and the details that I'm uh, that I'm contemplating doing a uh, shiur about it. We've talked about it before, but there's a lot of new chidushim, new chidushim that uh, we got recently that uh, we're contemplating doing something about. But uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be some more time. There's some more material to review. Uh, but either way, uh, just know when you're going with the Torah, surely you're going in the right direction, despite the test, the obstacles. Uh, and, and all the people that are telling you to turn around and go a different way, don't listen to any of them. Only listen to Hashem, go straight, you'll succeed, you'll have a fantastic life, and all of those fools will end up uh, either joining you and asking you for a blessing so, so you can help them, or they'll simply be left behind and uh, end up uh, losing everything as a result of it. Uh, as, as far as the, the journey, is not easy, it was never meant to be easy. But it works. Eventually the salvation comes. Eventually Moshe Rabbeinu was given the ability to take Am Yisrael out of Egypt. The tribe of Ephraim wanted to make their own rules. The blasphemer wanted to make his own rules. Shlomit wanted to make our own rules. All types of people want to make their own rules. Those people simply bring damage to them as well as the people that follow them. Don't be one of those people. Follow Hashem. Follow His holy sages. Follow with the words of Torah, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu will bless each and every single one of you with bracha, with atzlacha, with parnasah, b'shefa, with the ability to give chomesh, to help us uh, build this organization to be able to reach every single corner in the world. For every single person that wants the truth and is looking for a source, looking for the truth so they could change their lives, so they could serve Hashem to the maximum. Them and Bezod Hashem, us as well. Bauch Adonai Amen ve'amen.